Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the November 15th meeting of the Charles County Board of Education. Uh, can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we have uh, our new board, a few of our new board member elects in the audience today. So thank you very much for being here. And we will begin with uh, an update from the superintendent. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chairperson Wilson, board members, staff, and others joining us for today's meeting. I would like to start my comments today by acknowledging members of the newly elected Board of Education, some of them who are here today. The newly elected members will make up the 18th Board of Education of Charles County and will soon be sworn in next month. The board members elect include Dottery Butler Washington, Cindy Colby, I don't think she's here, Nicole Kramer, Yonel Moore Lee, Brenda Thomas, Jamila Smith, and Linda Warren. I welcome each of you and look forward to getting to know you and working to continue to improve and expand educational opportunities for every student. I would also like to congratulate our current board chairperson, uh, Michael Lucas, and current board member, David Hancock, on their re-election. I have enjoyed working with you and I am excited to continue our work together. The official swearing-in ceremony is set for 6 p.m. on Monday, December 19th at St. Charles High School in Waldorf. The ceremony will be live streamed to the Charles County Public School website and the School Systems YouTube channel. I encourage our community to members to tune in and watch. As the school system transitions into the second marking period, I ask our parents and caretakers to take time to review their children's academic progress in parent view. Report cards were posted for all students yesterday, and this is a perfect time to reach out to your child's teacher if you have not already done so to discuss any concerns. Parental involvement also ties into American Education Week. Sponsored by the National Education Association, American Education Week is held annually the third week of November. This week, Charles County Public Schools recognizes American Education Week November 14th through November 18th, and invites parents and community members to attend and participate in activities in their schools. Instructionally related activities involve students to make them aware of the importance of education, public education in America and the efforts of all school system employees and the community members to support public schools. A welcome break for students and staff is approaching next week as Charles County Public Schools will be closed November 23rd through November 25th for the Thanksgiving holiday. While the holiday season is about gathering with loved ones and celebrations, it can also cause anxieties and increased stressors for, um, for some. <clears throat> Excuse me. Families in need of support during the holidays or any time can reach out to the pupil personnel worker at their child's school. Pupil personnel workers connect our families with community resources and partners who can help. The school system also offers mental wellness resources for staff through the employee assistance pr program and information about these resources is located on the staff page of the school system website. For many of our high school seniors, the start of the holiday season includes more than celebrations and family gatherings. Early college application deadlines are often set in December. Charles County Public Schools is once again partnering with the College of Southern Maryland to offer a scholarship fair next month. The fair is set for Thursday, December 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. in the BI building of CSM's La Plata campus. High school juniors and seniors along with their families are encouraged to attend to learn more about scholarship opportunities and the financial aid application process. On-site help with the financial aid application will be available at the fair, and this is a great opportunity for students and their families. Today's agenda features several student and staff recognitions, but one that truly demonstrates the level of support staff show to their colleagues. 
specifically tonight. Later today, the board will recognize a special group of educators and students from North Point High School who acted quickly to support a teacher in need of um, an emergency. I am very proud of the relationships that exist in our school communities and feel fortunate to work in a school system in which staff truly support their colleagues, not only on a daily, but also in the most extreme times of need. Thank you to our staff and community for your unwavering commitment to our students and for your continued support of Charles County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Next, we'll hear correspondence from board members. Ms. Wilson. Good afternoon, everyone. I had the opportunity, along with several of my colleagues, to attend the all-county band mm -hmm. and all-county orchestra and just a friendly reminder of how talented our students are. Um, I also like to uh, highlight that I attended the Lackey McDonough football game. Um, the turf looks absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's spect spectacular. Um, got uh, opportunity to see a running back go back and forth on the, on the field, and it, it, it really looked fantastic. Um, I attended the Hol Halloween parade at Dr. Higdon, um, and as well as attending the Pastor Community Breakfast at Mount Hope Nanjamoy, um, which was very useful because the principal provided a number of ways in which the community could assist um, both for Thanksgiving and um, for Christmas. And I, I look for those opportunities as well in other um, school settings. I also had the opportunity, along with several of my colleagues, to celebrate Hispanic Month, um, to observe the panel discussion at Thomas Stone High School, and the Esau Community Night at John Hanson Middle School, which was very well attended. I attended my last committee meeting uh, as a MABE member, as the co-chair of um, the annual conference. Um, and it has been an honor to serve on a number of committees um, with MABE. And uh, one of the things uh, as a closing point to my new uh, board members is there is a new, new board orientation scheduled for January 31st at 9.30. It is online. There was a lot of discussion amongst the MABE uh, staff to encourage your new colleagues to attend. Across the state of Maryland, there is going to be a number of new board members. And anything that we can do to ensure your success, we strongly encourage your participation. Um, and also, continue to the, the tradition of serving on MABE committees. Um, we just had a colleague, uh, Ms. McGraw, Mrs. McGraw, who has served as MABE president. But there's plenty of work on other committees as well. Um, I want to also take an opportunity, because there's going to be some time between the next board meeting, that um, the McDonough um, Drama Club is sponsoring a band. The, uh, I hope I'm getting this name right. It's called the Flipping Eyelids. It's a <laughs> fundraiser this Friday <laughs> at 7 p.m. It is a wonderful way for the community to support the arts. The other thing is North Point High School sells uh, pies at the market in La Plata, and it is a way of raising funds for the culinary arts programs. So just a few examples of how the community um, can support our school system. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Anyone else? Ms. McGraw first. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to add that I uh, attended many of the same activities as Ms. Um, Ms. Wilson did, including the uh, honors course. And I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Bodemer, Tim Bodemer, because not only does he recognize board members, which I think is protocol anyway, <laughs> but he, he personalizes that and really thanks us for being there and supporting the arts. And I do want to make mention of the fact that I think it's very important to support the arts in the school because it helps to well, make a well-rounded student. 
Um, one of my passions has always been to attend student activities, and I try my best to get to a number of them. And the last one I did attend was Saturday night um, at McDonough High School, the production of Puffs. And it was a, a, a comedy, and it was hilarious. And I'd like to say to Ms. Heil, Jan Heil, who was also took the time to recognize uh, board members and to say how much she appreciated the support of the arts and to say thank you to her as well. Um, I also attended the uh, Veterans Day program presented by uh, La Plata High School, and it was very, very well done, a very moving program that honored our veterans. And um, the students uh, did an outstanding job, and I'd like to thank the high school for that invitation as well. Last night was the uh, Charles County Scholarship Committee meeting where they invited the family and friends who are donors to the scholarship committee and at this time they come once a year and they uh, discuss about why they um, are offering a scholarship in honor of one of their loved ones and to piggyback with what Dr. Navarro had to say <clears throat> about the scholarship um, I guess it's uh, the meeting that's coming up to help you January 1st is the beginning is the deadline is the uh, opening of the applications. March the 31st, I believe, is the deadline. And one of the things that we've learned is that students, you wait to the last minute to apply. <laughs> and oftentimes, things are missed. Um, uh, some of the parts of the applications are not there because of the timeliness. So I'd like to encourage you all, January 1st, applications open. There's over 100 of scholarships that are offered each year so i'd really like to encourage you to apply because many go on um uh, they don't give them up because they're very specific and students haven't applied for them so don't let that money go to waste and one of the last things i'd just like to mention was um i attended my one of my last meetings for as a part of the early childhood advisory council for the state and um one of the presentations was about all the new Judy centers across the state, but another one was done by the Maryland Public TV. And I wasn't aware of how much of a partnership they have with the state in early childhood education because they offered a wealth of resources, not just TV programs, but if you go to their website, there's many, many resources there for uh, families and their young children to prepare them for um, early childhood learning. So I would like to encourage our parents to take a look at them. There's even hands-on activities um, that you can run off for them to use. So there's a lot of valuable uh, information there. And that's, that's it for me for the month. All right, thank you very much, Ms. McGraw. Ms. Brown. I also had an opportunity to, to attend the Veterans Day program at La Plata High School. And I tell you, that could not have gotten any better. They were just fantastic. So I'm gonna to say to parents that if you are not seeing any of those course programs or band programs, you are missing a true treat because we really do have a lot of talented students. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Amira, yeah. Okay, I have just a few things I'd like to talk about. So recently I've been working with Dr. Navarro and Mr. Lucas to coordinate a town hall for students currently set to take place on November 28th a Microsoft form has been sent out that allows any students grades 6 through 12 to submit questions that they would like to ask at the town hall. And trust me, they have a lot of questions. <laughs> Prepare yourselves. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and now I am super excited to announce that I have recently opened applications for a SMOB advisory council. Applications are open for all grades, for all students grades 6 through 12. The purpose of this advisory council is to receive increased input from students across the county as well as allowing more opportunity for students to get involved in board affairs. And then lastly, I would just like to follow up on the student BYOD work session we had all the way back in September. This was where students were able to discuss their concerns with the current BYOD policy. So on November 21st, we're inviting all the students who attended this work session back to the Board of Education so they can draft a new BYOD policy, which can be presented to Dr. Jones and other board leadership for consideration. And then that's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Uh, just a few things I've done last month. Um, last month, we did have the, uh, the middle school championship baseball game, which was between Milton Summers and Pickle Waxen. Both teams did a great job, and it was a pretty close game until the end, and Pickle Waxen did win. 
So congratulations to them and to everyone that participated in the middle school baseball league this year. That was really cool. Had the opportunity to visit James Craig Elementary School and read to the pre-K classes there um, about uh, pumpkins. We read a lot of uh, pumpkin books, and the kids really enjoyed that. So. <laughs> and uh, even better than that, I got to go to career day at Pickle Waxing where I brought a calf with me, a baby cow, and the kids wow. really liked that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I look forward to visiting uh, Matula tomorrow, actually. So uh, it's been a fun month. What are you bringing to Matula, anything? Uh, just you? <laughs> they just want to see me, believe it or not. It's <laughs> hard to believe. But. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for joining us. Miss Battle Lockhart. Oh, my goodness. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, October, crazy month for me. I apologize for my absence in October, but I've been traveling across the country, um, focusing on apprenticeship, believe it or not. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to, uh, I'm excited for and talk about that happened in October is um, I had an opportunity um, to host a culinary night experience with all of our culinary students within Charles County Public Schools. Um, they had a chance to experience three top chefs in the Maryland, D.C., um, Virginia area and experience their food, ask questions, be in the presence of employers. Um, and the reason why that is happening, because we ha have now in all seven high schools, we have the Pro Start program where all the kids that are interested in culinary now get an opportunity um, to partake in learning all about um, culinary and having their culinary experience. And um, we've had an opportunity in my, with my other hat to partner with Charles County Public Schools um, with their pre the USDOL, Department of Labor, um, a pre-apprenticeship program where the students get credit for their learning. They don't have to do anything extra. They're just getting credit for all the learnings that they are uh, acquiring during their journey um, through culinary. And if they want to add additional certifications, there's funds that will be supporting them to get additional certifications on their journey of completion. So I'm very proud of this um, opportunity and I'm very proud to be able to continue my journey um, to support the CTE program. I want to thank um, Rebecca and Kevin because I have been on them <laughs> big time and they've been, they really um, have been very helpful on this journey. We are working towards getting all 151 students um, enrolled into the program. We um, are starting a, uh, our great journey. We're working towards getting them on board by November 15th. And um, the other thing that I've been involved with is um, I just attended their first Pro Start um, PAC meeting. Um, so give an opportunity to support the Pro Start teachers and educating and supporting them in the classrooms or anything that, anything that they need uh, for their students. Have had an opportunity to supply them with um, thermometers. Who thought thermometers would be so popular? <laughs> and aprons and such. And um, uh, with Dr. Navarro, we're part of the Business Education Committee with the Change of Commerce, trying to see how we can continue to build a relationship between businesses and education to ensure that we are preparing our students for the real world. And um, I do have some um, gifts uh, for my board members and Dr. Navarro, just um, continue to make sure that from the re Restaurant Education Association Foundation, um, talking about a pre-apprenticeship, because this is a funding opportunity that supports um, not just hospitality, but majority of the industries now. So you hear a lot about um, apprenticeship. So parents, 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 we need you to um, support your students on this journey because this is funding that supports them to get jobs in their industries of interest, um, as well as while they're in school, get funding support to continue to grow and build their resumes in ways that they probably wouldn't be able to do this prior to COVID. So let's take advantage of the opportunities. If you have questions, always feel free to reach out to any of the staff members, but I am here to support you and supporting your students. So thank you, Charles County Public Schools, for um, supporting this journey, and I'm looking forward to watching it flourish. Thank you, Dr. Navarre. Thank you very much, Ms. Padalocker. Anyone else? Table, nothing? No. All right. So I just have a few things. I apologize if these are repeats, but um, uh, 
I attended the, the closing ceremonies for the county's Hispanic Heritage Festival at the shops of Waldorf. And um, there were two Navarros there. Our superintendent was there. And, uh, and Nancy Navarro, who's um, uh, a, a council person from Montgomery County, uh, was there and gave a speech. And um, it was uh, for, for a first off event. I think it was well attended. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing that continue in the future. Um, Ms. Wilson mentioned the, the breakfast at Mount Hope, and um, you know that, that school continues just to be um, a jewel uh, in, in the county in terms of support from the community. Uh, and I too was at the All County Band Orchestra and Chorus, and I can't reiterate enough um, when when the, de the guest conductors we have the guest conductors that come from other parts of the state, and you know, they don't have to say this, but they do, and they talk about what a tremendous um, fine performing arts program that we continue to have in Charles County. And particularly for our size, you know, it, it, it's, it's better than, uh, you know, the big boys <laughs> in the state. And uh, it's, it's just a testament to the hard work of a lot of folks, and, and certainly Tim Bodemer is at the top of that list. So I just want to say thank you for that. And the uh, the ESOL event that Miss Wilson mentioned, um, there were over 500 kids there, and uh, a special recognition has to go out to uh, to Peter Murphy for his continued support of that program, and he's he's personally funded a lot of those events that that the school system has participated in and not necessarily sponsored, and I just want to thank him for doing that. Um, a lot of good sports going on. Uh, congratulations to the to the football teams. Uh, I was at the North Point game, and congratulations to St. Charles. Uh, much success going forward. And I also just want to give a shout out, even though um, they didn't come out in the win column this weekend, but the Lackey soccer team, um, fun to watch, and and they're they're super good, and uh, hope to see them up in the in the state championships in the next couple of years. I too went to the play in McDonough, I went Sunday, and coincidentally, Dr. Navarro was there as well. Even got a few of the jokes that they, uh, it was loosely based on Harry Potter, and so, you know, I'm not the, not the, the strongest Harry Potter fan, but uh, there are some funny parts in there. And then, um, again, another example of, of why the, the fine arts are important. Uh, I attended a virtual meeting yesterday. Um, again, Ms. Wilson mentioned uh, committees in MAVE. I'm on the legislative committee and um, I'll forward those notes to my fellow board members, but certainly a lot of things happening in this legislative session. I also uh, attended a presentation that was given by uh, Dr. Navarro's staff to the county commissioners on a, on a pilot program uh, at two schools in the county, and I look forward to hearing about that. Um, and these, these are you know, programs that are, that are looking to, um, to help kids that are um, you know, at risk and, and need, need some, um, some things to do after school. And I believe several of us were at the ribbon cutting ceremony at Dr. Brown. Is that right? Yeah. Forgot about uh, that one. <laughs> it's, uh, and that school is fantastic inside. I mean, it's just a completely different school. And um, as we continue to uh, uh, address our open classroom schools and put some walls up. I, I think that that's, uh, that's going to be met with nothing but uh, applause. And finally, several of us were in attendance at the new staff reception at, uh, that took place at North Point High School. And uh, I think having it in the gym was a very good idea. And thank you to everybody and thank you to the culinary staff at North Point. Food was, was great and the whole program was good. And uh, thank you uh, for all the teachers that, that make a choice to come here uh, to, to, to work and to live in Charles County. We really appreciate it. All right, so with that, we shall move on. And I believe we're gonna hear from the ACC. We're not gonna hear from Mr. Heil. We're gonna hear from Ms. Dawn Pipkin. How are you? Uh, how are you? I'm well, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself first, for those of you who may not have met me, uh, my name's Don Pipkin. I'm the full-time UNISERV staff or field staff from MSEA that works here in Charles County in support of educators here. So uh, Chair Lucas, Dr. Navarro, members of the Board of Education, CCPS leaders, and community members. This is American Education Week, 
and I know that all of you share EACC's commitment to the promise and opportunity that public education provides to the children of this community. To follow through and encourage the promise that public education should be for the children of Charles County, we all need to be committed to not doing what we have always done. We need to examine the structures, the processes, and the priorities we set, all the while listening to the voices of the educators, both certificated and support personnel, because they are on the front lines doing their best for children while feeling the weight of the workload and the expectations that just keep increasing day after day, year after year. I'm sure that none of us in this room would disagree with the urgency to give our children the best possible experiences and education that we are able to provide. However, if we don't commit ourselves to examining the workload and the expectations we place on the shoulders of educators, we will fail to retain and recruit the high quality workforce that is necessary to deliver a quality educational experience to our students. I'm gonna share with you a sampling of concerns EACC has heard from educators just in the most recent weeks. Not all of them, but just a snippet. So, quote, we're being asked to sign up for multiple committees at our work site, but are not being given the time to complete this committee work. And time isn't provided for committees to meet in the duty day, so this adds more meetings and workload on an already burgeoning plate. Quote, our school is running a two-hour early dismissal schedule on a normal school day for specialized programming, like pep rallies and PBIS events, and we all know they're important. But every time we do that, my already limited planning time is shortened, or a schedule is created where some staff don't have planning in the schedule, and we have to advocate for making sure everyone has at least the length of that shortened period. Quote, I have data spreadsheets to complete and share with leaders to monitor progress and share information on student performance. Adding the information to the spreadsheet is in addition to the regular data I collect through classroom assessments and grading student work that needs to be communicated to parents through progress reports and report cards. Adding this data to a spreadsheet does nothing to help me prepare better lessons or plan for interventions or make more engaging assignments for my students. Quote, I've now been assigned to cover a class for the 20th time this year in time that's not my self-directed planning. Although I realize we are still working to address the staffing shortage and the need for substitutes, and we do appreciate how hard everyone is working, having to provide coverage really impacts our school climate and morale, which leads to a vicious cycle of staff taking days for their own mental health. Quote, my schedule doesn't provide transition times between any classes, so I lose minutes of lunch and planning time every day when I take my students to and from the cafeteria or to their special area classes due to this lack of transition times built in. Quote, my school schedule doesn't allow the full contractual minutes for planning because our periods are less than 45 minutes at the secondary level. Because staff should be on hall duty to support student transitions, our school regularly loses planning minutes in order to maintain a safe and orderly environment. These excerpts are just a few of the concerns EACC has heard from educators in the last month and has worked with building reps and leaders to address and will continue to do so, but something has to change. Collectively, we cannot say we are about teaching, learning, and supporting educators and allow these working conditions to continue without being addressed. The time to remove the phrase from our vocabulary, I know you have a lot on your plate, but here is something else that needs to be done, is now, right now. We need to prioritize the work that directly impacts teaching and learning, and we need to take a hard look at what needs to and will come off the plate. If we fail to do so, we continue to feed our patterns of resignation, retirement, and the never-ending hiring cycle that is required to keep our schools fully staffed. Together, we have the power to address these challenges to make Charles County Public Schools the place that can be proud of its supportive educators and the students they serve. CCPS can become that district that reflects on what we are doing and makes changes that will make a difference in our retention numbers. All we have to do is flip the script. 
and stop accepting that just doing more is required and focus on the most important aspect of our work, teaching and learning. We need to evaluate what we are committed to taking off the plate in order to support all those who work tirelessly on behalf of students, from our building leaders, to our classrooms, to central office. The time to make these changes is now, and EACC looks forward to collaborating with the Board of Education, the new Board of Education, and system leaders, and making positive changes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Pipkin. Next, we'll hear from Sarah Birch from AFSCME. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Birch, president of AFSCME Local 2981. Everyone likes good news, so here goes. <laughs> AFSCME is now reinstating free college. Any AFSCME member that has been a member for six months or more is eligible to apply. Information is available on www.afsme.org slash college or call Eastern Gateway Community College at 888-590-9001. Or online at egccfreecolleg.org. I can send flyers to any member interested. Over 14,000 members have received degrees from this program since it started. Another bit of great news for instructional assistance is the stipend has been returned to IAs that are substituting for teachers. Food and Nutrition Services has moved from upstairs in the Starkey building to the former Oasis cafeteria on the first floor. The best way to reach me is by email, sbirch at ccboe.com. As Thanksgiving approaches, we should all reflect on how many things as AFSCME members we have to be grateful for. Free college, free life insurance, yearly raises, help with financing a new home, auto insurance, car rentals, American-made products such as tires. Most of all, be grateful for our family, friends, and co-workers. Enjoy Thanksgiving and your days off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Birch. All right, Ms. Acton, I believe you're next. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. How are you? I'm well, how are you? Very good. Joining me this afternoon is our budget manager, everyone has met her before, Sherry um, Fisher Davis. So the superintendent is requesting an intercategory budget transfer of $4.5 million in accordance with Education Article 5-105. The request is necessary to support the implementation of our new enterprise resource planning system. Charles County Public Schools is implementing Oracle Cloud as a replacement to our current system, the AES 400, which is more than 25 years old. The new ERP system is a crucial infrastructure update that will improve the overall efficiency of the school district. The breakdown of the cost that is needed is $5,378,310 for our new implementer, $379,196, which is needed for additional third-party implementers, an analyst program of $115,000, fringe benefits of $40,250, 
and we also have a credit against that amount which was left over from the previous implementer that we did not spend of one million four twelve seven fifty six which is four million five hundred thousand dollars and what you can see on the screen is um, this this money we are asking for this change to come from our prior year fund balance um, which is you'll see the revenue um, under revenue up there and four million four fifty nine seven fifty is under administration and then the forty thousand two fifty for fixed charges um, we're asking for this approval and if approved it would go before the county commissioners for their consideration and approval any questions? thank you Ms. Sack. then any questions miss wilson all park figure um, timeline yes um, so our goal um, so we're currently in the assessment phase with the new implementer because since we had to get a new one they have to assess where we are and see if it's where we thought we were um, but our goal is to go live with the financial um, part of the system July 1 of 2023 and then the payroll HR um, portion January 1 of 2024 that's what we're our timeline that we're looking for thank you mm Miss -hmm. McGraw um, Ms. Acton just for the benefit of our new board members could you just give a brief explanation of what the enterprise system is yes so it's it's um, it's basically our financial system it integrates though HR and finance together so that they are talking to each other Whereas right now we have separate systems um, that can't talk to each other. So this is a much more modern system, which is a, it's a heavy lift to go from the dark ages to the current day, but um, staff is working very hard to make this happen and it will be, um, it will be very good for the system. You know, we probably will have some process changes that will come along with that because what we've done is archaic and we've done it because our system is archaic. Um, and to go to a modern system, we may have to look at some workflows and um, change those. But um, with the support of the superintendent and se senior leadership, we'll make those changes. And when we get to the other side of it, we'll all we'll be much, much happier. Be able to get reports that we can't get now. Be able to track things um, better than we can now. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Ms. Abel. Yes. For this. So, the so ongoing or one time cost? One time cost, and then it'll be in the budget moving forward. So, it's part of our budget ask for the next cycle. Um, we, at one point, had three prog analyst programmers. We were down to one. And in order to get this project across the finish line, I asked the superintendent, we really need a second one. Um, part of the holdup with the previous implementer is the data conversion right. that's necessary. Um, so it's it's critical that we do this now and not wait for the next budget approval which would move it to July hopefully we can find that person because we know how challenging it is to hire um, but I just wanted to confirm for the public that yes. there was a um, plan in place since our fund balance is supposed to be used for one time cost. that's correct so it is a one-time cost and we'll include it in our budget ask hey, hey. Thank you. And on that, I think uh, I get to in a second, Mr. Hancock. The um, uh, I think this kind of demonstrates, you know, why you have a fund balance. People say, why do you have a fund balance? And and this is a perfect example of that. And and the the, the mechanism for for having to to go back to a funding source to try to get money is just the the time constraints and and the hoops you have to jump through. Um, this is why you have a fund balance and as Ms. Abel just reiterated it's for a one-time cost so just wanted to point that out Mr. Hancock thank you chairman and uh, thank you Ms. Acton um, just out of curiosity by transferring that 4.5 million from the fund balance what is the current fund balance with that deduction sure it'll be 22 million 319 136 um, and just to give a little bit of an explanation, 4.6 million of that <coughs> is reserved for health care costs because we're self-insured. 4.3 million is a contingency fund. And then the remaining 13 million, 13.3 uh, million is capital maintenance reserve for those um, emergency maintenances that need to happen and also for technology um, 
issues that come up throughout the year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, Ms. Wilson. And I just want to add, when an air conditioned unit on any one of the 33 plus facilities goes out at any given time can be a very expensive proposition. That's just one, one of many examples of, you know, it's a lot of money, but it takes extremely a lot of money to maintain the, the school system. It does. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Acton. Next is Mr. Heim. Mr. Andritz. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome new board members. I'm joined today by Steve Andritz, who's our Director of Planning and Construction, and we have a few verbal updates with project status update. Uh, first project we'd like to highlight is T.C. Martin, so that two-year renovation is progressing well. If you happen to be out in that area, all over Shop Road, if you would drive by that site, uh, it's a shell of its former self. So exterior walls, interior walls, plumbing, and all those things, uh, all the electrical wiring, data wiring, all that has been removed. The asbestos has been removed from that site. Uh, and referencing the site, the site has been marked for where the wells will be drilled for the geothermal system. So to become a as part of our becoming or trying to become a more greener, more environmentally friendly and energy, more energy efficient school system. We are converting that school as part of the renovation to geothermal. Uh, some other projects that are progressing well. Uh, contractors are working hard at J.P. Ryan Elementary School and Malcolm Elementary School. Uh, they have the, the pad site has been poured. Uh, the walls are going up and they're working hard to get that site, uh, both those sites under roof in advance of, you know, what could be some winter weather. Uh, so that way uh, the interior work that uh, will go on can progress without any interruptions, hopefully from the, uh, from the weather we may experience this, this winter. Uh, we have the Eva Turner Elementary rededication scheduled for later this month on Wednesday, November 30th at 4.30, so we are excited about that. We are still excited about that project. It was completed over a year ago, and as Mr. Lucas had said, on uh, Friday, October 28th, we had the brown ribbon cutting ceremony, which was well attended. But I have a, a feeling that folks were there also because it just coincided with the tr trunk, trunk or treat event that was occurring that night. You're but right. Brilliant move. Showed up. We were happy to have a large crowd for that exciting uh, ceremony. Uh, and I didn't get any candy, but that was a little disappointing. But it was a well attended. It was a great event. Uh, and again, another project that we were very excited to have that uh, completed. And speaking of open space enclosure, a project that you don't see on here, uh, but is under design, is the pickle wax and open space enclosure. Uh, so Mr. Andrews and his staff have met uh, a number of times with the, the architect and some of the engineers who are involved in designing uh, that project, which is set to begin uh, this summer. And again, <clears throat> that project is moving forward as a result of uh, one-time funding from the county commissioners. So we are very thankful for that funding, uh, which also allow us to later on do uh, the Indian Head open space enclosure and the James Craig Elementary open space enclosure. So we are thankful uh, that those projects will move forward be uh, because of the funding we receive. And Mr. Andrews, anything else you'd like sure. to highlight? Uh, two other comments I'd like to make. Number one is the barbering program over at the Steedham Center. Obviously, we got the building ready to open for the start of the school year. We've been waiting on the HVAC unit to show up, as we've talked about before, with lead time issues out there, especially with things like mechanical equipment and switch gear uh, being such a prevalent issue in construction these days. I uh, actually just got an email this morning that the HVAC unit for the Steedham Center showed up at the Riggers Yard yesterday. So we'll be working to get that coordinated to get on the building and tied in and get them service as soon as possible. And we did have temporary cooling yes. in that building, so uh, please yep. don't fret. Uh, yep. In the hot months of August and September, uh, there was cooling at uh, the barbering yep. program, so we had a temporary unit that was set up uh, until the permanent unit could be uh, put in place. The second comment I wanted to make <clears throat> is about the Malcolm project. Uh, Malcolm Elementary School Full Day Kindergarten is a project that we have partnered with maintenance on for items that they asked to have done. And one of the things that's being done is a sprinkler system for the entire school. 
So per code, we had to sprinkle the new addition, but the building only had about six heads in the whole, sprinkler heads in the whole building oh. from the original construction, and they were in some uh, mechanical closets. So we did a project as part of that to provide the protection for sprinkler system and the tank and everything for the entire school. Uh, we got that tank delivered a couple weeks ago and it has been set. They're framing up the building with the masonry around the uh, right hand, rear right hand side of the building. It's a very large tank. It's 40,000 gallons of water storage for fire protection. The additional comment I wanted to make here is that the contractor actually has been working weekends and it's about two a month to go back in. They work through the summer putting the mains through the hallways, but they've been working in the classrooms through the weekends to get those tied in and get the heads put in so that when we're ready to turn it all on, it's just the flip of a switch and they're all ready to go and it's not a mad shuffle to get that all done this coming summer. So we've been extremely happy with the coordination we've had with the general contractor and their sub at Malcolm to get that done. And it's always nice when it's also a local contractor. And so. Keep in mind, Malcolm is a school that's on its own well. Uh, yeah. So that's the reason why we have the fire tank there. So it's not one of our schools where we have the sprinkler system, which is tied into the, you know, the, the public water system that feeds into those sprinkler systems. So we have that large fire tank there because of its location out in a more remote area without uh, public water and sewage. On a well that we had to replace a few years ago, yes, as I right. recall. Yeah, another, another use of fund balance. Sorry, yeah. had, to, had to get that in. We don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ms. Um, Dr. Navarro. I just wanted to see if uh, Mr. Andritz or Mr. Heim could just give an update on the work that's happening a lot of times during the weekends and evenings in the Plata High School. I've gotten some questions and sure. I've answered them, so I just thought for the public yeah. knowledge, yeah. sometimes you see this huge crane on the weekends and then it disappears and then it comes <laughs> back. So just if you can address what's happening and the timeline for Absolutely. that. Absolutely, I can talk about that. So La Plata High School is a project that was funded with ESSER funds, um, ESSER II to be specific. And ESSER allows you to apply for HVAC replacement projects, which is what is happening at La Plata High School. Um, La Plata High School has a unique style of heating and air conditioning, and there are mechanical rooms and mechanical penthouses that have two and three tiered layers of heat pump units. And it is a project that maintenance generally has about two guys there almost every day throughout the week working on them and doing stuff doing repairs and so on. So when we got this project approved, we designed a completely different style of HVAC system to eliminate all those. We're gonna utilize the existing uh, rooftop units and ductwork for fresh air, and we're putting in uh, what are called VRF, variable refrigerant units, in the classroom spaces, they're cassette units, to run the heating and cooling. So through the summer, this past summer, the contractor worked diligently to install all of those VRF units in the classrooms and offices and all those spaces. Uh, what they've been doing in the evenings and weekends, because after summer was over, we made them shift to second shift or weekend work. Especially weekends, what they're doing is they're setting steel on the roof to support equipment or they're placing equipment or they're placing ductwork, things that we don't want done during the school day when there are people inside. Uh, we do not allow cranes to swing equipment or uh, other items over occupied space. So those are technically scheduled after hours or weekends. So that's one of the things people are seeing there. What the contractor is doing is now through the school year, they're working four 10 hour days starting on Monday through Thursday. They work three to one and they are going into the classroom areas and they'll do one area at a time and they're making all the final connections for the refrigerant piping for the condensate lines for the electrical connections because what they did was just put the boxes up and put the ceilings back. So they're trying to get as much of those things done as possible so that this coming summer when the air has to be shut off completely, we're able to actually work in the penthouses and get things done that we can get it completed at the end of the summer. The reason this is such an aggressive schedule is ESSER funds had a very tight timeline. They have to be completely um, work done by September of 2023, and they have to be completely paid out by November of 2023. So the contractor has been working very aggressively, and this is not a small project. This is um, 14, almost, yeah. Do we have it on here? With the yes, and I also, as Karen is looking at me, I'd like to also thank Ms. Acton because we did use some fund balance. Uh, so we, beyond the ESSER funding, uh, there was some fund sure. balance that went into that project. It did come in over, yes. over budget. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's a that's approximately a fourteen million dollar HVAC replacement project at Lapine High School. Which, just for the for the situational awareness of our community, what was our what was the original number that Mr. Heim gave me about and staff, uh, and staff <laughs> about uh, eight months ago or ten months ago? And then what is the real? I mean, you mentioned fourteen million, but the reality of material cost, which is which is real when we do our our expenditures, In, in, including design, we had budgeted around ten uh, million right. for the project and. Uh, when it went out to bid, uh, we were several million dollars short. And that several million dollars that Mr. Heim is mentioning is also based on a engineer's estimate and cost estimator's estimate. It was not just, you know, back of the napkin numbers. So that was originally 11 based on what we had there that we were moving forward with bidding. And unfortunately, during the bidding process, due to materials and all those other issues we always talk about, that's how we wound up at 14 million. And also, as you know, Steve was mentioning, with work occurring in the evening times and on weekends, you're paying high, higher labor yes. uh, than you would if, you know, during the traditional hours of them working six to two or six to three during, during daylight hours. Yep. But then results, we're very excited because this is one of the schools that we had concerns with as we went around, as we were reopening schools, uh, as we were talking about ventilation and air change rates in, in classrooms and in and, and spaces within in, in schools. So this was. Uh, the number one priority uh, school based upon our analysis of, of the school and concerns within that community. So we we're very grateful that we were able to proceed with this project. All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Ms. McGraw? I have some questions about um, elementary school 23. Yes, ma'am. I, I noticed that this month the bids were supposed to go out in November but it's pushed back to December now. Could you tell us why? Um, so we have been working through some coordination details with the developer because we do not yet have the property. So we're trying to time everything with that because we obviously have to put it out to bid. We have to open the bids. We have to bring the contract before the board for approval. We have to have the IEC, the state body, approve it and then actually enter into the agreement. So we're trying to make sure those are as closely coordinated to the time that we're going to get the property from the developer. Um, part of that is some adjustments they've had to do because originally that property was going to be two sites, two school sites, but they redesigned the neighborhood and took it down to one. And so they had to make adjustments that the county required of them on the plans. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, as you see, it's actively being mined and graded and changed. And we want to make sure with what is in the documents to the bidders, it is as clear as we can make it what they will actually receive when they get on site because the contractor will still be working all around them and it will not be finished. It's not a virgin site they would come into. It's not a renovation of an existing building. And so the more we can do to eliminate those uncertainties, the more uh, we are able to make sure they're not adding additional onto pricing to deal with those um, unknowns. So we, we've delayed it a little bit. It's going to go out the beginning of December. So it's a little bit behind, but it's still adequate enough time to construct it once, once it's all done. We anticipate contract award uh, around the 1st of, of April. Uh, oh, because right, so that was my next question. The estimated construction was supposed to start in March, but it, that's going to bump it up. It's going to change about a month. Okay. So with a two-year construction window, it would be April to April. And usually, how much advanced time do we uh, estimate that we're going to need for naming a school? And I'm not going to use that R the district word. District I'll say it. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> so redistricting would start uh, next fall around this time, so okay. that we could uh, have enough time for the two committees that will be formed to uh, both make a recommendation to the superintendent and for the superintendent to make a recommendation to okay. the board. Of course, during that whole process, we'll have a number of public meetings, which the public can come out and mm -hmm. uh, provide comments, uh, both before the committees begin, but also as uh, you know, two alternatives are put out there for the public. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, uh, with the board taking a vote uh, in June of 2023, which would put us, uh, I'm sorry, June of 2024, 24, uh, which would put us uh, over a year in advance of the, the building opening. Yeah. Okay. And then for the naming committee, we don't actively participate in that. I don't know if 
Um, if Ms. Mackey would like to answer that. I know you've worked on those before about how long that process takes naming committee. It's generally about three months time, six months time. Um, each board member would give a recommendation for a person to serve on that committee. Um, a member from the communications team would lead that committee. Um, we would um, survey the community for um, school names, review with that committee, and then come to the board with recommendations for a review. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Heim, could you just remind everyone where Elementary School 23 is or will be? Sure. Elementary 23 is right across from the Glen Eagles neighborhood, so it's on the southbound side of St. Charles Parkway. So if you're coming from Waldorf towards the La Plata area on the southbound side of uh, St. Charles Parkway, uh, after you pass the golf course on the left and you have a uh, senior living community on, on the right, uh, you'll see you'll pass one area past the Mar uh, Homestead, uh, which is being cleared. It's the second area right before you actually go down the hill where that little bridge is on the right hand side there. And you'll see as Steve was referencing right now, there's large mounds of, of soil right now, uh, which are being taken off off site. So that is the location. So it's the school, the actual location of the school is just several hundred yards off of, of the roadway. Yes, the, the neighborhood in the St. Charles community is called Highlands neighborhood. Um, and it's St. David, Drive is the name of the street that's going to front the school. And that's right. one Thanks. of three sites that uh, that developer Lenar still owes Charles County Public Schools from Docket 90. Okay. Very good, thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it's okay with my fellow board members. Can we move on? Uh, to the next item, which is the blueprint update. Ms. Miller is here. We'll get a break before the next one, Ms. McGraw. <laughs> Saw that look. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hi, Miss Miller. How are you? Hi, I'm sorry. Huh? You're fine. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Miller. I'm the um, coordinator of district innovation, and I am the Charles County Blueprint Implementation Coordinator. And I'm here to give you a monthly update on the blueprint for Maryland's future. Thank you. So this is a timeline that we've seen before. Um, as a reminder, the blueprint goes from 2022 up through to um, 2032. So it's a 10 year plan that we are um, going to be creating. Um, it's not a one time plan that we live for 10 years, but the plans will be um, submitted in phases and we will be updating and reviewing them on a yearly basis. So right now we're looking at our first um, phase one submission to be due on March 15th of 2023. So last time I came to you, we talked about how the AIB was going to release the draft comprehensive plan and the prompts that go along with it. Um, that was due to be out on October 15th. It was delayed a little bit. Um, and we did receive um, the actual comprehensive plan on the 26th of October. And the template, which serves as prompts and a means for us to post artifacts to, was released on November 4th, along with the criteria for success. The AIB is still um, taking comments on these draft documents, and they're looking at releasing a final draft to us by December 1st. Again, we have until March 15th to actually submit our um, Charles County plan. 
Um, as a reminder, we did hold a, a series of stakeholder feedback sessions. It was very important to us to look at these comprehensive plans that were being set forth by the AIB. Um, at, we had a virtual town hall session. The EACC hosted a town hall session. Um, we had, I was invited to the PAC meeting, um, and we have also uh, gathered some stakeholder feedback from our various steering committees so we could present some feedback to the AIB regarding their draft. So I want to go through and share with you um, some of the, the summarized feedback um, for each of the five policy areas that was collected. And then I'd also like to share with you some of the questions that we internally have that we would like to share with the AIB um, about the process. So the main objectives for Pillar 1 are to expand publicly funded pre-K, assess student readiness in kindergarten, and to expand those family supports. Remember, Pillar 1 is all about early childhood education. So what we collected, what um, feedback we collected from our stakeholders is this idea of universal pre-kindergarten versus expanding pre-kindergarten in Maryland is two different things. When we hear this idea of universal pre-K for everybody, we're all expecting that pre-K is free for anybody who wants to attend. And as you know, according to the blueprint, we um, have a tier system now. Um, the board can elect to um, have a universal pre-K program. However, it will come at a cost. We will not receive funding for students above 600 and 1% of the federal poverty um, uh, source. And also students uh, in the tier two, there is that family share uh, where we would get some funding from the state, some funding from the county, and then the additional funding for our tier students would be up to the families. Um, so there are questions around that sliding scale uh, for students who fall into that tier two, which is between 301% and 600% of the family of the federal poverty rate. MSDE has not re released that information yet, but we are eagerly anticipating that um, so we know what to tell our, our families. Um, some additional feedback about uh, early childhood is that the requirements for our pre-kindergarten instructional assistance are too strict. Uh, we, the blueprint is saying that they have to have either an associate's degree or get a child development associate degree. Um, we're talking about the KRA requirements. Um, some suggestions came through to see if there was a way that we could test students during the summer as much as we can. There are um, components of the KRA assessment where um, the teacher has to observe some behaviors working with students. So of course that probably would not be able to be done during the school or uh, during the summer, but was there a way for us to, to give as much as we could in the summer so it wasn't interrupting any other part of the day? And then last but not least, this idea of space um, and money and requirements for our private and our public um, pre-Ks. You know, the blueprint does want us to expand our private providers, um, but what we're hearing from private providers in Charles County is um, there is a disconnect between the capacity that they have right now when it comes to the requirements that they have and even the, um, the ability to have space. The private providers don't have access right now to um, startup funds to expand pre-K into, into other buildings, so that's an issue. Uh, pillar two, which is our high uh, quality and diverse teachers and leaders. Here are the main objectives uh, in the blueprint for that. We're looking to recruit um, and maintain a high quality and diverse teaching staff, increase the rigor of teacher prep programs and licensure requirements, implement comprehensive in-service educator training, establish new statewide education career ladder and professional development system, 
and improve our educator compensation. So the feedback that we received, thank you, Ms. Dr. Jones, uh, about Pillar 2 from the community and um, our various stakeholder groups included the following. Um, there has been discussion about this additional assessment for out-of-state teachers once they come to Maryland. Um, we're hoping that that is actually being addressed in different um, committees right now. Uh, we're looking at how can we um, look at possibly including apprenticeship programs and scholarship opportunities for some of our current employees that already work in our schools to become teaching candidates. What does that look like and how can we um, leverage that aspect of our programs? Um, we're talking about the Institute of Higher Ed Deserts here in Southern Maryland. Um, we have, uh, we, we are working with um, Anne Arundel Community College right now to help us with um, our uh, pre-K uh, instructional assistance if they're interested in earning their associate's degree uh, through the Maryland Leeds Grant because Anne Arundel Community College is an approved vendor to use. Um, so we do have some concerns with the uh, institutes of higher ed deserts that are in Southern Maryland. Um, think about when we go to, I know, uh, Ms. Wilson talks about when she goes to Salisbury and she recruits on behalf of Charles County. A lot of those candidates are staying in that area and teaching there. So how is the state and going to help us um, when we are trying to hire candidates for our positions? And then um, we do have questions about the career ladder. That will be a negotiated piece of, of the um, contract. And then this, um, these questions continue to come up about principles and the teaching requirement. Um, what does that look like? Um, what does that not look like? Uh, will we be, start to look at the placement of our, of our VPs as to what their certifications are? Will we base the number of um, vice or assistant principals based on the number of students in a school? There's all these questions that come up with that. Pillar three, college and career readiness. These are the objectives for the blueprint. Uh, students shall have equitable opportunities to become college and career ready. They'll meet the standard at an equal rate. We're going to keep our students on track for college and career readiness. We're going to implement our college and career ready pathways and provide high quality career counseling and CTE programs. So here's some of the feedback that we received. Um, there is some concern that students only have one way, only one measure to become college and career ready. Um, we're looking at um, some feedback that included some staffing concerns to meet the requirements of the tutoring and the interventions for students who are not college and career ready. We have to provide those differentiated supports. And then there's also concern behind the cost to provide these pathways. So those that are college and career ready, um, we need to pay for AP opportunities, dual enrollment, CTE. So the question has come up about funding with that. Pillar four, more resources to ensure students are successful. Uh, these are the objectives from the blueprint that we accurately ID students who need more resources. We improve the education of English learners, improve the education of students with disabilities, we provide supports for students attending um, schools in a high concentration um, with students with high concentrations of poverty, and we enhance student health services. So some of the feedback that we received on this pillar includes additional funding to help with these wraparound services. With the community school program, most of the funding that we receive um, goes to salaries for the community school um, coordinator and the health care provider that comes along with that. Um, it, some questions came up about students who live in communities of um, poverty, but they don't attend schools that are in the bigger picture. Um, so how do we support those students as well? Um, what are the plans to address um, 
uh, or continue to address the educational gaps due to COVID and the plans to address the educational gaps between English learners and special education students. Last but not least, um, pillar five, governance and accountability. Create and review and approve the implementation plans. Establish and employ, or deploy, excuse me, the expert review teams. As Just as a reminder, we do have two staff members here in Charles County that have been hired um, or um, contracted to work on behalf of the expert review teams. Uh, coordinate with Maryland's participation in PISA, and then monitor the blueprint outcome. And so the feedback that we received for that is we want to ensure that representation on all of the various subcommittees and committees within MSDE and AIB are representative of and, and uh, of Charles County. Um, do we have a voice when it comes to that? And then there's also concern about the human capacity to do this work from every single level, from the classroom the whole way up to the AIB and MSDE. So some of the strengths and the questions that we have in, in general when it comes to the blueprint, um, we are very thankful that the AIB provided a template for us because the original comprehensive plan <laughs> was ambiguous is the word I'm searching for. <laughs> the template does a Fair really <laughs> The template does a really good job asking us and probing the questions that they want to see. The amount of space that we have to answer the questions is going to be limited. They don't want the fluff. They want us to get right down to business and tell us, you know, they want us to tell them what are we doing and how is it going to impact our students. Um, we are excited that they are looking for artifacts of within the plan of what we're doing, where we're going, and where, where we're coming from. We like the idea that there is criteria for success, so we know what should, you know, as a formative assessment guru, you know that the criteria for success excites me very much. We know what success should look like. Um, the AIB and MSDE is doing a really great job communicating with our superintendents and with our implementation coordinators. Um, they are taking our feedback and working very hard um, to make changes, hopefully by the December 1 deadline. Um, the AIB is doing an incredible job to, with only having three people on staff right now, to get this information to us. We're now having weekly meetings with them and collecting feedback from the implementation coordinators to get back with them, which is really nice. Some questions that we have and we will be submitting is, will, will we, if we turn our plans in by March 15th, which we intend to do, um, will we receive feedback on our plans before June 1st? And the reason why we think June 1st is such an important date to receive feedback on is, as you know, a lot happens in the summertime. We do a lot of planning and we do a lot of training. We do, a, you know, it's like a reset for the year during the summer. So we are hoping that we will get feedback on our plans by then so we can really take this plan and move forward with it. Um, there are a lot of charts that we uh, have to provide data for within the template and we are hoping that MSDE may be able to pre-populate some of these graphs and charts for us. Maybe not for the first uh, March 15th deadline, but maybe um, subsequent uh, uh, deadlines that come up over the 10 years because they do have a lot of the data that they are asking for. Um, and what are we going to do regarding de data that is required in the plan? Um, that we don't yet collect. We're still um, awaiting that information. And will MSDE take our, our plan and will their support be targeted based on what each individual school system's needs will be? So do you have any questions or comments on this so far? Ms. McGraw, <laughs> first, thank you very much, Ms. Yes. Miller. <laughs> thank you. I just comment, um, I read through the draft, that's, God bless you, <laughs> you're the one that has to, to fill that, to do all that, that's very comprehensive and um, detailed. 
But I'm confused. Who who actually do you have to submit it to? MSDE or AIB? Both. Yeah. Oh. So you'll get feedback from both? I well, I the, the MSDE is going to be the one that really provides us the feedback, the criteria for success, but AIB is the one um, who can withhold our money. But I anticipate that. I the doom no, and gloom I, tour here, but no. um, three person dance. Yes. <laughs> I have no doubt that you will do a great job. Well, it's not it's not me. It is the I team. mean, it is such a, a joint effort between so many people here. It is incredible. So um, I am just the one that gets to talk about it. Um, but certainly it is the responsibility of so many people. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Miss Battle Lockhart. Are we talking about the system as, as a whole or the individual processes within the policies? How we implement those to create success? Oh, so there is, right. So one of the questions that we brought up today um, as we met with the AIB and the Blueprint Implementation Coordinators is what is the non-negotiables in here, right? What gets us to the point of we're in trouble. Um, so this criteria for success, it is broken up by pillar. It's broken up by each prompt, mm -hmm. but it doesn't tell, it, it's not, um, there's no rating on it. It doesn't give us a score of any sort. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it just kind of um, gives us some information as to whether or not we've met whatever that prompt is. Mm -hmm. And there's several pomp prompts that are all throughout um, the template. So there's several questions that we have to answer on pillar one and several mm -hmm. different um, data points that we have to include. So the criteria for success looks at each of those prompts and graphs and tells us whether or not we've met that criteria. And this criteria is based off how we're implementing the blueprint, not specifically how it's trickling down to the student success. It's based on the blueprint. Okay. But the blue, the, the, right, but the questions are very much uh, in aligned with how to move student achievement forward. Yeah. So remember that the blueprint was created looking at the best school systems in the world and what is it that they do so well. Mm -hmm. And so the blueprint outlines these practices. And so, you know, although it doesn't, there are questions that are targeted very much on student achievement, but there's also questions that are targeted on, on the practices that support and encourage student achievement, if, if that No, makes. yeah, no, okay. I, I'm, you know why I'm asking. Okay. Just, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make sure that everybody's clear on what that criteria is focused on because, you know, when we come down and implement that, it's different for every student. It so. is because they say this is what we can achieve, it's gonna look different for every student that we serve. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Wilson. There's um, so many different areas in which we can take a deep dive and this is, this is uh, there's a lot, a lot of moving part, parts to this, but as it pertains to early childhood, um, the budget process, we're in the beginning of the budget process, Charles County is unique in, in terms of being a bedroom com community, and a lot of parents could greatly use the early childhood, you know, enroll, enrollment. Is there any, it, you don't have to answer it now, but will there be consideration going forward um, in terms of uh, coming up with some sort of startup funding for the private sector to kind of you know, get this engine started because we need the private sector to help us with this. And if, if they're already um, suggesting that that is a challenge, is this something that we could work with the county commissioners, given the special consideration of how Charles County is, um, not that the services is, is meant to be as, you know, babysitting by no means, but we all know how important early childhood is. You know, if we can jump stop, jump start some of the early private early childhood facilities in some capacity, I think that would 
it's a win-win situation. Yeah, so, um, Chris, maybe you can summarize the, the meetings that we've been having with the private providers thus far. And what I would say is the blueprint has a very clear requirement for um, public uh, schools to meet a certain standard, which, by the way, we will not meet, which is 30% of our seats for pre-K be in, um, for eligible pre-K students, excuse me, be um, in private providers. And there is a lot of, I think a lot of my colleagues across the state are having difficulty meeting that. To your point, Ms. Wilson, I do think we need to be creative and, and, and talk across um, not just within the Board of Education but across the county on what are the flexibilities. Um, private providers are a small business and the county can look at it as a, a small business venture. Um, one of the things I did say in the multiple meetings we've had with private providers is that the non-negotiable that I want to establish is whether you are a private provider maybe um, that is close to being certified by MSD, approved by MSD uh, to receive this funding, or you are not, which we also have a lot of, of, of providers that are not even close. What we want them to do that is non-negotiable is have a good relationship with us, because our plan is to, as much as, as possible, include in our professional development opportunities, in our resource and in our learning opportunities, uh, the people that are taking care of our future students in a couple years. So they're all our students and they're just coming to us in a couple years. So we absolutely have a interest in strengthening those uh, relationships, but we also have a mandate by law to figure out a way locally in the local jurisdiction to have private be a shared option for families for pre-K. So um, as Dr. Navarro said, we have um, uh, organized uh, with Beth Soresby, our early child, childhood specialist. Um, we've done several presentations um, with our private providers here in Charles County. Um, first of all, to talk about the opportunities that are available for them to receive state funding. Um, and as Dr. Navarro stated, there are requirements that they need to meet in order to get that state funding. Some of those requirements include they have to be certified uh, teachers in early childhood education. They have to meet the mandates for the amount of the, the numbers that they can serve. Um, they have to, uh, uh, if they have employees within, if it's not, um, if it's not just one person and they have employees that they have to have uh, pay their employees that is around where we're paying our employees has to be equivalent to that um, and so there is apprehension with that one because there are uh, several of our early child care providers here in Charles County that are not certified teachers um, so that is a big um, loop for them to jump through because as Dr. Navarro was saying that not only are they providing education they're teaching right to our students they're running a business too so um, you know while I'm in the classroom as a teacher and I was a teacher for you know uh, several you know 10 years I was not a small business owner thank goodness because I'm horrible with money. Ask my husband. He gets mad at me every time I go to shopping or go to Target. Um, but I never had to think about that, right? All I had to think about was educating my kids. So we're asking, um, or the state is asking, that these private providers not only have a small business, be teachers during the day, but also to have that additional certification um, in the evening, maybe. Um, so it is, there is a lot of apprehension on the part of our private providers to go forward to seek this state funding. And I might add no incentive. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really depends on how well, much they're they, charging. They, they get incentive because they do get paid for, for, for the do. people that attend. Yeah. yeah. 
but many of yeah. some of the other private providers that we've spoken to, um, they are they like this. They are happy servicing the students and the families that they have relationships and connections with. Maybe there's there are um, uh, kids that are already in their neighborhoods and in their community, and so with the process of of um, accepting state funds, you don't really have a choice into who you're necessarily going to accept into your program. Yeah. So I have a question. What happens if we, and, and I think other LEAs are gonna be in the same situation, don't meet that, that threshold? Of, Nobody's meeting it this year. Yeah, so what? Not that it, yes. We're, we don't know. Okay. Um, and, um, we're waiting to hear what the feedback is from the AIB. Okay. And is it, just throwing out suggestions, is it, is it unreasonable if, if, to your point, that there's no, um, there's no certified, if that's the right word, um, certificated staff at, at the private providers? Um, if. I mean, the school system could provide people. Is that a true statement? That's a gray line. It's a gray area right now. Um, there are some districts, um, you know, this came up on our call today, um, that are working with their head starts. Um, it's a very gray area that hasn't been defined for us yet. Where, where if we hire some people, like, like we do every year, um, at a school and, and they're, they're teaching four-year-olds and then they transition to the school that those kids are going to go to and, and, and then the kids are seeing their, their kindergarten teacher that they had as a pre-k teacher <laughs> and, and you, could, you could continue with that cycle but anyway I'm sure there'll be lots of um, lots of discussion as this moves forward and the, the other thing I wanted to, to say, you said the feedback that we received. So I'm assuming this is, this is internally from the groups that Dr. Navarro set up. When you said the feedback that- or So it, it came from the town hall meetings that we've had. Okay. Um, it came from the steering committee groups that we've had as well. Okay. So I, I just know that, that the group that I've been involved in and, and you know, lots of people did more work than I did. I just, I think that was a great idea to include board members um, in each of the areas uh, to provide, um, you know, insight and just to have just kind of on the radar what's going on. And at, at the May conference, I will say, I, I spoke to just very briefly one of the people on the AIB there on the panel, and I mentioned your name and she said that we're in good shape. <laughs> so <laughs> take that. Yeah. Now, I, probably not in, maybe not in, you know, everything we're doing, but certainly in, in our implementation right coordinator. Right. Yeah. We are in good shape. So I just wanna, I wanted you to hear that because you. Uh, she knew Very who much. you were. Yep. Mr. Hancock. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miller, for the presentation. It's always good when you provide us uh, updates on the, on the uh, blueprint. I have a question, and perhaps you've answered this question in previous updates, but I've never really understood why, why is the blueprint pushing for us to have a certain percentage of, of private educate, education for, for pre-K anyway? What's, let's say, I know we don't, but let's say we had enough seats here in our system. If we had enough seats, and would they still mandate that 35% right now? Probably not. No. I think a lot of it has to do um, well, th th there are two, th there's different reasons. Um, again, uh, looking at the amount of space that our current LEAs have, and do they have the space to accommodate all of our students who would want to come to pre-K? Um, and I will say just based on the phone calls and the meetings that we have, um, the fact that we are able to accommodate our 300 per our students who fall within the 300 percent is um, we are ahead of many of our other systems um, so i think a lot of it has to do with the amount of space that is available um, 
but I don't know where the number of 30% and then that 5% um, increase came from and what the relevancy is. But, you know, there is something to be said about this idea of partnerships between our community, early childhood, and our school system. Because even if you have a early childhood program, a private pre-K in, in a daycare center, um, you know that that's going to be a high quality uh, uh, early childhood pre-K program because it, it we have to monitor it, they're receiving state funding, their curriculum has approved, and so we know that the other classrooms in that early childhood center are likely gonna be impacted by that, that they're going to see high quality teaching, that they're going to have, um, the, the other employers are gonna have access to that. So I think there's something to be said about spreading this wealth of, of resources and spreading this um, knowledge base with, with people. But that's just my guess. I, I don't know if Dr. Navarro, if you know something a little. Well, what I would add to that is there's a lot of diversity in, in private providers. And there were lots of conversations around supporting the private industry to also meet a certain standard. But also high quality private providers to also be more inclusive in the ability to have inclusive populations. So, you know, if I'm in a very wealthy neighborhood or area and there's a private provider there that only uh, has the students from that area, uh, there is also incentives about how do I incentivize that quality private provider to also um, provide opportunities for those rich learning environments um, for, um, students that are impacted by poverty. So I think there's sort of a couple of different interests. Um, and I don't remember how the, how the metric actually came out to be. I think it's gonna be very telling to the state and to the uh, AIB how difficult it's been for us, local jurisdictions, and for the state to sort of stand up to this number. Um, and just the different realities that, that jurisdictions have in their ability to connect with private providers. Thank you. And one more question with all this feedback, and it is a lot of feedback um, that is presented to the state and the AIB. Do you think that um, some of these could possibly be resolved? Some of this feedback could, or is what's done is done and everything is set in stone? Well, the law is the law. Right. So the AIB does not have the ability to change the law. Um, what they are doing is they are taking actionable feedback. Um, you know, some, the idea of pre-populating some of the, the um, graphs. Um, they're looking at that idea of, I'm hoping, the, the June 1 deadline. Um, you know, th things that are um, actionable, that they can take action on, they have done a really great job. Um, over the summer, they met with us and took our feedback and um, they made significant changes on a lot of the things that they produced this summer based on the feedback. So I'm, I'm very um, hopeful. Well, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Miller, awesome as usual. Okay. Thanks for all your information. Really appreciate it. Okay. And we'll see you next month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, four and ten minutes. All right, uh, we're gonna go on break now. Let's uh, return at uh, Three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue with our meeting. Next up, we're going to hear a presentation on the Phoenix International School of the Arts, otherwise known as PASODA. I'd like to thank everybody for being here. And who's up first? Up Chris. first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having us here today. <laughs> Thanks for welcoming me back. <laughs> um, I want to introduce, and I know we're welcoming back Steve Andrus, the Director of Planning and Construction. And I am very excited to introduce Ms. Angelica Jackson, the co-founder and uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Phoenix International School of the Arts. And so we're going to update you um, with the progress of PASODA, and we're going to talk about um, charter schools and 
of the soda in general. Thank you. Oh, no. good job. <laughs> Before we get into the presentation, I just want to remind um, all of our audience and our stakeholders that Pasota is a charter school. And this in Maryland means that uh, it is a public school. And it will be, when it opens, a part of the Charles County Public Schools. Um, when it opens, it will become the ninth middle school in Charles County Public Schools. And because it is a public charter school, there is a choice to apply. We're going to talk about the application process later on in the presentation. There is no tuition or admission test that students have to take in order to come in. Um, and again, we will go over the enrollment policy. All of the teachers that will teach there will be Charles County Public School employees. Um, but again, we'll get into that as we get into our presentation. Just some reminders and some <coughs> background between the relationship between Charles County Public Schools and Pasota. Um, in April of 2021, the board approved the application for Pasota. Um, our application can be found on our Charles County Public Schools website. In October of 2021, uh, the Board of Education approved the charter agreement. That is the legal document or the contract between Charles County Public Schools and Pasota. In December of 2021, they, the Board of Ed signed the charter agreement. Uh, in August of 2021, the uh, charter was amended due to a facility change. Oh, that's 2020, yeah, that is 2022. And in September of 2022, uh, the Board of Trustees from Pasota and the Board uh, of Education of Charles County signed the amended charter agreement. So without further ado, again, Ms. Angelica Jackson is going to talk to us about Pasota and the school. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you to the Board of Ed, the superintendent, and community members for welcoming us again to present on Phoenix International School of the Arts. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I especially want to thank this board uh, for making the historical approval um, of Phoenix International School of the Arts charter agreement last year. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to first spend some time introducing the team behind Pasota. I'll then expand on our mission and vision for the school's impact in the county. Um, following, I'll do an overview of our academic program. I'll speak about how families can apply for enrollment consideration and how families can learn more about Pasota at our upcoming event. So that's what I'll be speaking about. Um, leading the governance and strategy of Phoenix International School of the Arts is a multi-generational board of trustees, um, volunteer, and they have a combined 90 plus years of professional and volunteer experience in the K-12 space. Um, our collective areas of expertise include curriculum design, education policy, media and communication, school administration, finance, and more. And each board member has worked closely with improving the lives of young people through education, policy and research, the arts, public health. Um, I like to think of our board of trustees as Jedis because the work that they do is deeply focused and um, with a mind turned to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So that's where the Jedi comes from. Um, several of our members of our board are from and work in Charles County. Um, Dr. Winsome Waite, it was employed with Charles County Public Schools for 20 years. She actually was a founding leader at Mattawoman Middle School. She helped to open that school. Deborah Collins is a resident and community health worker. She um, has been an administrator and teacher for Charles County Public Schools. Uh, and then also Monique Newton Walker is a Charles County resident and a parent in the county. Um, and she is also a local arts education leader. We have the VP of Marketing from the Kennedy Center on our board and just so many other really cool um, expertise and uh, insight that is part of our board of trustees. And at this time, we have, great, that's wonderful. At this time, we have two full-time staff members, myself as the Chief Executive Officer and Rick A. King, who is uh, here as well, as the Director of School Culture and Auxiliary Programs. We are both co-founders, which means we both wear several hats and perform many functions to get Pasota open for the 23-24 school year. We have been with the school since the early community engagement and charter application writing phase. Um, myself, for the past decade, I have shared, uh, served in various positions within the field of education, including as a teacher, a reading and writing instructional designer, and an education consultant. And simultaneously, I've led direct service education nonprofits um, for learners of all ages. 
And most recently, um, I have led professional development for some of our nation's largest school districts as part of a na national social impact ELA curriculum provider. And I always like to just add a, a little bit of my why for um, being part of the founding team for PASOTA. I am the daughter of a single mother who is also a military veteran, and a, I'm a first generation college graduate. So I was taught firsthand the value of a strong education, but I know all too well what it's like to have limited access. And PASOTA is the result of that instilled value of global education in myself and why I'm part of this team to open it here in my hometown of Charles County. Um, my colleague Riquet has a professional background in psychology and mental health, nonprofit management, um, as well as uh, a deep focus in international education and global culture and change. Most recently, he was a principal fellow at a high-performing public charter school in Baltimore. Um, and prior, he was an adjunct prof professor at Pepperdine University. Um, he is intentional about preparing and connecting our Pasota scholars to opportunities in higher education as we think about college and career readiness. That is all him. That's his, that's his primary focus. Um, and he is a product of charter school education. And um, he leads uh, a nonprofit called the Now Boarding Corps, which works to increase access to study abroad opportunities for young black men. So Pasota's design has been community driven from the start. In our community dream sessions, which were these design sessions we held with members of all ages in our community, these five key design pillars for the school were constructed um, by students, by community members, and then they were refined by teachers, administrators, and researchers. Um, we also consulted with uh, the World Economic Forum and as well as top universities and conservatories. So together, these pillars work to comprehensively prepare scholars to be engaged citizens, um, globally competent leaders, and creative thinkers with the hard and soft skills for them to be successful beyond middle and high school. Um, many of the school's curricular components align to these five pillars. For example, with pillar two, which is global competence, leadership, and bilingualism, um, we are adapting a curriculum that is a globally renowned curriculum called Cambridge International. Um, and our in-school and out-of-school services ensure that our scholars can work toward multilingualism by the time that they graduate. Um, so, for example, our scholars will take a modern world language other than English starting in sixth grade. Um, and then the integration of global competence leadership development um, is part of our core subjects as well as our extracurricular activities. Another example is aligned with pillar three, which is mental health and holistic wellness. For instance, our social and emotional learning and behavior self-management components of the school align directly with mental health and our holistic wellness pillar. You can go to the next slide, thank you. So we are often asked why the name Phoenix International. So Phoenix is a symbol of renewal and regeneration. It reflects the ability to create something bold out of nothing, like an artist or an inventor or an innovator. And so we believe our scholars, their families, and our community, like the Phoenix, can and will rise above their circumstances to reach their greatest potential. So at Phoenix International School of the Arts, we rise. And um, that is our uh, mission. The, the name, the Phoenix International School of the Arts, encapsulates our mission and our vision for the community. We believe that when students are deeply engaged in concepts that relate to them, that they will develop a deeper understanding for those core academic concepts. We believe that when students are engaged in arts integration to learn those core traditional academic content, they will then create uh, they would design creative solutions to address social issues that are important to them, integrating the academic concepts that they learn in the school. And we are a huge proponent of ensuring that our scholars feel loved, that they feel seen and heard, because when they do, they're able to show up fully as themselves and be deeply engaged in their learning. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit more about our academics. Again, I mentioned earlier that we are implementing a curriculum called Cambridge International. It is a globally renowned curriculum and recognized by employers and universities worldwide. Um, and so part of that curriculum offers the same, uh, the curriculum offers the same subjects that any scholar in the community would take and learn. So the math, the science, your English language arts, social sciences, technology, health, phys physical education, modern world languages, and then the standards that are uh, tagged to Cambridge International are mapped to Common Core State Standards. And that was important for us so that if scholars are moving between Phoenix International School of the Arts and other schools within the district, they are able to do so seamlessly. 
Um, but some of the key curricular components are that we are project-based, meaning that our scholars are learning those core academic concepts as part of, uh, you co part, excuse me, collaborating as a team. They're using projects to learn those concepts. It's very much uh, active and, um, yes, that's project-based. There are also uh, a lot of the habits of character for our scholars are integrated into those core academic subjects in learning lesson plans as well. A key component of our curricular program is that in addition to our core academics, we are also um, offering a core arts pathways. And so these are the arts programs that we intend to offer at the school. There's voice, dance, theater, visual art, instrumental, and museum studies. And each of those um, arts pathways have a course of study. So courses that are aligned to each of those pathways at the school. Um, well, I'm going to say one more thing about that. That's okay. Um, so uh, in addition to those core academics, they will, our scholars will engage in their arts courses every single day. So that's one thing that we like to emphasize is that for families who are interested in attending Pasota, they should know that they will be engaging in some form of arts education every single day. Thank you. And then our social and emotional learning is a key component, right? It's part of our key design pillars of mental health and holistic wellness. And the purpose of our social emotional learning uh, program is to ensure that our scholars feel like they belong and have a sense of agency in the community, our learning community, um, in their classrooms um, and among one another. We want to ensure that they feel like they have a say in some of the decision making at the school. And so one structure that we implement at the school is called CREW. And this is a structured advisory um, of, a, of a small group of scholars typically no more than 12 scholars, and then an adult who we call the crew leader in the building, and they meet, meet with this group every single day to have critical conversations um, around uh, social, the social environment at the school, around their academics. Um, in this, this space, one of the uh, components that we implement is called um, an individual wellness plan. So you may have heard of an IEP. Um, it has a similar model, but we call it the IWP where the crew leader and the scholar develop wellness goals for themselves. It could be, for example, five minutes off of your phone a day or something like that. Um, and in that crew, their peers and their crew leader hold them accountable to um, meeting the goals that they set in their individual wellness plan. So that's just a, a, com a component, an example of a component <coughs> of SEL program. And here are ways that we intend for families to be engaged with PASOTA at the decision-making level, at the grassroots, just in the classroom, volunteering level. Um, so we do intend to have a family representative on our board of trustees, um, all the way to um, having crews for the arts-specific parents, um, our scholars at the school. So having a crew of parents for our theater program and so on and so forth. And so here is just a recap of the Phoenix International Way, what makes us distinctly different. Certainly the keen focus on the multilingual proficiency, um, intentional focus on our social and emotional learning. We are a smaller school, which is why we do have to implement um, what I'll speak about in a few, which is um, a lottery and things like an application process for the school. We are a smaller school so that we can achieve that close-knit school environment. And with the impl implementation of the Cambridge International Curriculum, the globe is our classroom. We're part of a global consortium of schools that implement that curriculum. And again, arts education every day is part of our curricular design. So enrollment. Um, enrollment at Phoenix International consists of three parts. Um, we have an open enrollment period that will occur until December 16th. And during this period, we are hoping that any and everyone who has an interest in Phoenix International School of the Arts will apply um, because if they do, they will then be eligible to, to be part of a lottery. We will have to do a random and fair lottery. It'll be a virtual lottery if we receive um, an, um, an excess number of applications, then we have spots available. So for each grade, if we receive too many applications, then that would necessitate a lottery for us. That lottery is expected to be held in January of next year. Um, and then anyone who applies after December 16th, they will be put on a wait list. They will not be part of that lottery. So I say if, if families want to uh, be part of that lottery, go ahead and 
submit your application now so that you can uh, be part of that lottery. Uh, after the lottery is uh, held, families will be notified of their status, their admission status, and um, families will have the opportunity to accept or decline their offer to, the, to attend Phoenix International School of the Arts. And as we start to get that information um, and spots become available, we'll move people off the wait list and offer them a spot at the school um, and so on and so forth. To learn more about Phoenix International School of the Arts, we do have a few events coming up. One is tomorrow that will be held at Waldorf West Library. It's gonna be a panel style informational where guests can ask all the questions they have about the school to our board members, myself, um, the founding team, and also we'll have a representative from the Maryland Alliance of Public Charter Schools at the event um, just to talk about what charter schools are, what is our vision for um, impacting the community and about the school itself. And then we're also um, in partnership with Charles County Public Schools holding two virtual information sessions um, on Monday, November 21st, and then Tuesday, November 29th. So you can scan that QR code to get more information about those upcoming virtual information sessions. I think I'm now going to pass it to Christina to talk about our continued collaboration with CCPS and um, our agreed upon uh, timeline revisions. Okay, so what does this partnership look like between Pasota and Charles County Public Schools? So we have bi-weekly check-ins where we discuss pro progress, we provide technical support and assistance, and we advocate for the needs of um, Pasota by setting up meetings with CCPS personnel um, so they can get um, the required information that they need. We've had meetings with budget and finance, communications, due to nutrition services, planning and construction and technology. Um, we are having future meetings with human resources, transportation, and also safety and security. So within the charter agreement, this bullet here is um, directly from, it's language directly from the charter agreement where Pasota shall notify Charles County Public Schools in advance of any anticipated delay in the meeting of the timeline and the superintendent in her sole discretion has the authority to extend any deadline without the delay constituting a violation of the charter. So um, we met on October 26 um, between Dr. Navarro and her team, uh, the Pasota Board of Trustees, Ms. Jackson, um, Dr. Rake King, um, to discuss some of the timelines that haven't been um, met. And what we did was we agreed to some revised timelines to be met in order to have an opening of August 2023. So in this chart here lists what the charter agreement states and any revisions that were made based on the 1026 meeting and what the language was. So on September 1st, uh, the copy of the lease of the deed was due to, to us, and we had to send that up to the state superintendent of schools for approval, and that target was met. September 15th, um, according to the charter, we, were, we needed written approval from the owners of the facility for Pasota to make any renovations. Um, that target has been met on November 3rd, so we do have that information. Um, on October 1st, according to the charter agreement, and we revised it to November 8th, that the superintendent, oh, November 18th, thank you, um, that the superintendent will be provided with a copy of the design um, documents, development documents related to the renovation. And this information will be sent up as well to the um, state superintendent of schools. Um, November 15th is when we, uh, originally in the charter, but we changed it to November 30th, um, where uh, Pasota would provide the superintendent with a copy of the letter of credit, which is dedicated solely to the construction of the school. And on December 15th, we made, uh, uh, November 15th, excuse me, we made changes um, to uh, the superintendent with the construction documents, with any updated costs, and application of permitted permits to be changed to December 9th. Um, I, and I'm going to introduce Steve in a second, but these necessary permits um, are going to be within the town of La Plata because that is where the school facility is. So with that being said, Steve?
Okay, so the next item uh, was a revision from originally November 15th to January 16th to provide a executed contract with a general contractor, um, including things such as payment schedule, um, general contractor's payment bond, and uh, any information that goes along with that. And uh, this obviously is a critical item because uh, construction is taking longer due to materials and lead time issues, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So we worked with uh, Pazota at the meeting on the 26th and after that to get that date uh, locked down for a reasonable amount of time to get the work completed. Um, the folks here at the board obviously were acting in advisory capacity to Pazota to help them um, with what they need to do to be ready to open. <clears throat> the next item is uh, a change from originally January 1st to January 23rd to actually start uh, demolition and construction in the facility and um, the ability for CCPS to go in and look at the facility. This is a, a private facility. It's a lease space, uh, commercial space, and um, this is obviously important too because you need to start that construction in order to be ready for opening in August. Here are some important emails and information regarding Pasoda. Their website is listed at the top. There's an email address for questions about enrollment, questions about careers, questions in general, and um, any questions or concerns about partners and trustees. And we wanted to, again, highlight as we take questions and comments, just the upcoming events for our community so uh, our community members can have access to that information. So, yeah. And also mention that. Yeah, the PowerPoints are all, all of the PowerPoints are available on the uh, board docs <coughs> website. Thank you so much. Is this, I haven't checked lately, is this like scrolling on our CCBO e homepage? I know, I know there's a link from it from the home page, but. The, the PowerPoint or the information? Or, or just the information, like like this last slide you just pre, you just presented it's might be. A, it is. I think it's one of the tiles. It okay. Is. I think I saw it there, but, but if it's not, it might be a good idea just to, to yes. put that in there. I think it's, it's on there. It's on there. Perfect. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm sure questions. Ms. Battle Lockhart. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, question for you. Uh, I, I don't know if I missed it, but what's the capacity uh, going to be of the school? Sure. In our first year, we project to have 150 scholars. Okay. And is there going to be um, testing upon entry, entry to ensure that we are knowledgeable of the learning loss that we've continued to deal with <laughs> with all students? Yes. Yeah, so similarly to all of Charles County Public Schools, those formative testing um, to see where our scholars are will be held at the school. Okay. And you mentioned staffing briefly, but um, I know they're CCPS, but st because due to our challenges that we're having ourselves, um, how are you s um, supporting in that initiative? Because this is a partnership in finding staffing for the. Yeah, so, um, and I invite superintendent to speak to this as well. But um, so we are like Christina mentioned, as a public school, our teaching staff, they do have to be certificated. Mm -hmm. And so we are part of the recruitment schedule with mm -hmm. Charles County Public Schools. So while we are engaging with that, we also um, have, are working on our own partnerships with uh, organizations that help with teaching, teacher recruitment um, and that sort of thing. So yes, we are partnering with Charles County Public Schools and, and going through the process that CCPS offers to recruit teachers, um, but we are also engaging and have already started engaging um, different organizations in our own personal networks to recruit teachers as well. Okay, and I apologize if I missed it. Now, right, because you're gonna be located in La Plata, is this a zoning thing or anybody in Charles County can come to your school? It yeah. sounds like what I heard. That's a great question. So as public charter schools, um, do not uh, require zone or anything like that. So anyone in the county can attend Charles County Public Schools, and we are partnering with the county to offer transportation for these scholars um, as well. 
Yeah, that's my biggest. Con- that's why I'm asking the question: Is tra- w- with transportation, of course, again, because <laughs> we're having challenges with transportation. If this is giving access to um, any child or family in the county, transportation sounds interesting to me. But I would, um, you know, as we go down this road, I would love to understand. Well, I w- I'll be listening in. <laughs> from the new people <laughs> um how this is gonna look but um of course i think i think it's a great concept i think um kids are gonna have fun because arts is always fun when you add it to education but um let's, let's see what happens i'm looking forward to it congratulations good luck i think i think the zoning thing that that i heard anyway it, yeah. it's in the town of the plata so so the process has to go through the town of the plata rather than that, or in addition to, or rather than the county, is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's permitting-related work has to go through the town of Plata, not Charles County. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know this is just something because I deal with the work with new restaurants and stuff opening, um, and I hear it in the county. How how is the and I hear it from you guys a lot too. The permitting process for this to start, are we feeling good about the timeline based off of those challenges? Um, so I, what I have seen from the town of La Plata is for commercial permits, it takes about four weeks minimum. Um, and so we have baked that time and it's a little cushion into our construction schedule. Um, so we're imagining as we approach the holidays see the winter break we are c- considering that it'll be maybe a little over four weeks yeah. for the permits because i know it's a state thing but i was just curious all right Thank you. <laughs> any other questions all right well thank you very much and dr king want to say anything <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're here all the time. I see you out in the yes. public and just appreciate your work, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. One last thing. I'm, I'm sorry. So one, yeah. one last thing that I think is important. So, you know, um, I think uh, I'm very glad that um, Pasota is here today and, and, and I think we are in a good place to continue to work jointly together. I have been representing you um, in meetings with their board. Um, I would suggest to um, the new board to get an update of how this is flowing. Opening a charter school is like sort of starting a business and never having done it by itself. It's not something that, it's not an infrastructure that is supported from the get-go. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of running around that happens and so forth. And so we haven't yet started, or Pesota hasn't yet started actually, um, reworking the the building as necessary um so it might behoove as the community comes closer and and families apply and there's a process for lottery and the building starts getting in shape to welcome students in august it might behoove the the new board um uh, to consider get, getting an update in the springtime. It allows uh, also for Ms. Jackson and her staff to come in and talk a little bit more detailed about uh, programs and, and what it looks like. And it can be you know later in the spring because spring um, you know, happens as early as March. But it could be one of those timelines where I would suggest that probably we do just another update uh, for the sake of the public too. All right. Very good. Thank you again. Thank you. Mr. Schwartz. several policies that the board is being asked to revise and or amend uh, these first set of policies were policies that brought forward at the last board meeting as, <laughs> as an information item this is a report item today they'll be coming back in December as an action item these policies are, are four policies that change the uh, number of board members that make up a quorum of the board um, because we're expanding our board from an eight member member board to a ten member board we are expanding the quorum from 
five to six and the number of votes needed to pass motions to six. And that's reflected in four different policies that the board was presented last month. And I am here for any questions today, if you have any discussion or questions you have. Yeah. Around, it seems again. fairly straightforward, yeah. We'll be back at the December board meeting for final action. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. The next is a, a new policy uh, change that we're bringing forward for the first time as an information item. This is policy 3910 concerning leases, entering, uh, entering into leases for the school system. Currently, policy says that the board shall determine whether to enter into leases or not. And our practice has typically been that the superintendent and staff handle that on behalf of the board. And we're clarifying that in the, in the policy change to say that the superintendent shall decide to enter into leases and will inform the board when we're doing so. That policy change is being brought as an information item today for the first time. Will be brought back as a report item at the November work session and then final action at the December board meeting. Okay, any questions on this? Makes sense. Okay, okay. very Thank good. You very much. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Ms. Mackey. Oh. So I apologize. She is um, coming right now. Thank you. And we just had to um, um, give a, send out a brief information to some of our community schools. So I think she went out to check on that. Um, so if we can maybe begin to pull it up. Or we can go to the next item on the agenda and come back. Okay. Uh, we don't have it. We don't have the next, well, well. Calendar. Yeah, we can, we can do this. What are we gonna do? Sure. Is there? She might be coming. Here she comes. Uh, it's okay. I will update the afternoon. board later. Well, activity. I have some notes I'd like to grab. Yes, no sure. problem. Don't worry. I know. No problem. We'll update it later. I was about to look at my phone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry for my delayed arrival this afternoon. I'm Shelly Mackey, the Director of Communications, and I'm here to update you on the 2023-2024 um, draft calendar. Um, just to catch you up to speed um, and review for the public as well, last month I came before the board and presented two draft calendar options. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the draft options were um, the work of a calendar committee. Um, both of the proposals include a pre-Labor Day start date, the 180 required instructional days for students, the 190 contracted work days for teachers, and four inclement weathers built into the calendar. There were two options presented. The first option includes um, three possible weather dates built into the spring months with an additional added at the end of the year if necessary. Option two includes the traditional four inclement weather days built into the end of the school year. Next slide. So calendar options. Um, we generated a survey to provide um, community feedback on the two options presented last month. So the survey was launched October 27th. It was open for about two weeks. Um, both of the calendar options were posted on our website with a six question survey. Their survey was completed through the Qualtrics platform. That's the platform that we use to do many of our surveys, strategic plan surveys. It's what we're using right now to do, um, to gather community feedback on the blueprint and draft plan. Um, we received a total of 1,472 responses. The data is here on the screen, but you can see a large percentage reported they were apparent. We had large student participation as well as staff. We had parents who are also staff members, and we did receive 11 responses from community members. Uh, just to share some of that data with you. Next slide, please. Uh, the survey was shared through multiple methods. Uh, we posted um, information on our social media pages, on our main website. We posted the survey on all of our school websites. We sent it out by email um, to parents, staff. We did send it also by email to students in our secondary grades. 
um, as well as send it out to our local media outlets. That's our standard information sharing process um, through the Office of Communications. Next slide. So the survey included six questions, um, and this presentation has a summary of 38 pages of data um, that was collected through the Qualtrics platform. So um, this question includes, or excuse me, all of the questions include a visual um, through the data report. But the first question on the survey um, was really to gather community feedback on um, are people in the community aware that students have to, by law, attend 180 days of school each year? 93% replied yes, 7% replied no. Next slide. Question number two got into the specifics. What option was preferable? Option one includes the three inclement weather days that are built earlier in the year with an additional at the end. Option two is four inclement weather days built into the end of the school year and it models, that second option models the current calendar in place for this school year. Then there was a neither. 51% um, of respondents preferred option one with 42% option two and 7% neither. And for the neither response, there was an open-ended um, opportunity to provide some clarification why you chose neither. Next slide. So for those who chose that option, there was about 110 responses provided. Some of the feedback provided, you'll see listed here. Um, some folks would like for us to model our calendar similar to other states using the hours versus the days. Um, there's too many consecutive work days for teachers without a break. Um, some respondents also requested that students should be allowed to come to school virtually on inclement weather days, expanding winter break, um, removing identified weather days altogether, um, add makeup days as needed. Um, next slide. Question number three, this is to gauge feedback from the community about the start time. You know, when you talk about expanding winter break or um, expanding Thanksgiving break or any other closures within the calendar, you know, that's going to shift the start and end time for the calendar. Um, so 50 per six, excuse me, 56 percent of our community prefers that we start school before Labor Day, which is our current model in place, with 44 percent uh, saying they would prefer a model in which schools would open after the Labor Day holiday in September. Next slide. This question, um, we're looking for data to find out if the parent-teacher conference day is utilized. 60% um, said yes. They utilize the day that's built in the calendar for parent-teacher conferences, with 40% indicating that no, they don't utilize this time to meet with their child's teachers. Next slide. Question number five. Does the school system communicate with its stakeholders any calendar changes, school closures, and early dismissals? And this question was included in the survey because both of the options have inclement weather days built in, especially that option number one. Um, if you recall, there are days designated in that calendar that are already listed as school closure days. If we needed to open one of those days back up, um, there was conversation last month about that time frame and how soon we would notify parents and teachers and staff of opening those days back up. So I was really looking with this question to gauge from the community if our um, stakeholders think that we already do a good job of notifying the community in general of any calendar changes. 85% responded yes with 15% responding no. So question number six, this is the last one. This is where um, you'll see there were 542 responses provided. And this question asked, what other suggestions do you have? There's two slides with data. Um, what I did is I spent uh, one evening last week looking through the results and kind of tallying what um, I saw consistently throughout co um, comments. Um, top trends included closing schools and offices for Veterans Day. Um, extending winter break to two weeks or for this particular calendar model, adding an additional day um, on December 21st as a system closure. Extending the Thanksgiving holiday for five days as opposed to three days. Um, there was a lot of feedback and support for moving two hour early dismissal days to Fridays rather than sprinkling them throughout the calendar. Um, there was support for moving parent teacher conferences in November. Um, and also adding maybe a second parent-teacher conference day in the spring, adding asynchronous days for students and teachers. Uh, there's also some support for removing fair day as a school closure day in September. Next slide. 
There's an additional support for adding mental health days for students and teachers, um, requesting of the state government to convert our model to an hours versus days. Again, I saw virtual asynchronous inclement weather day responses. Consider adding additional closer, closures for religious holidays, closing system for full spring break, not just schools. There are a few days um, during spring break in which offices are currently open. Um, you always get support from the community about announcing inclement weather decisions earlier as opposed to um, the four or five o'clock model that we currently follow. Eliminating the semester break in January, starting school after Labor Day, implementing a year-round school model, starting school earlier in August, and then also collaborating the calendar with surrounding counties in regards to um, opening earlier in August so that schools would close um, either at the end of May or in June. Um, next slide. Final slide is questions. I know that was a lot of data to share. Um, again, this is just a consolidation of a 38-page report um, with the top trends um, from the community. <coughs> Any questions? So, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be questions, but before when um, when does the calendar have to be approved? So the typical um, model, the approval process, is there's two report items to the board. The first was completed last month. Today would count as that second qualifying um, information item process. And then the calendar could be up for approval at the December board meeting. So when's the latest it could be approved? I think that's really um, up to the board. So I, I didn't know if there was any obligatory thing that we had to do for the state no there okay. is not there's not enough, uh, uh, but um, we tend to want to give anywhere between you know six to eight month headway for families to know how to plan for the following school year at minimum and typically the approval process is a year out right um, prior to the pandemic that process, the calendar approval process, would come in the spring months, be it a March, April, May approval process, April, May, June, and that was a full year done in advance. So the community had a full year's notice with what that following year's calendar would look like. So we've condensed that time frame a little bit because we are in the 22-23 model looking at 23-24. Sure. Any Comments, questions? I do also want to point out that both um, both proposals show Veterans Day as a day off. Both proposals show a full week for spring break. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, those are things that in the past people have asked about. Um, so they're in both of the uh, of the suggestions that were put forth. Any other questions? Questions, comments? comments? No. Thank you okay. for completing Thanks. the survey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shelley. Appreciate it. Um, so, if it pleases the board, we could, there's some things after recognition. We could take care of those now unfinished business and agenda items. Or and then Ms. Abel is always a stickler for sticking to the, <laughs> to the <laughs> schedule. <laughs> Just trying to tidy things up. Okay, well, we will wait then. Pardon me. All right, so where we are then, going to be on break until oh. 4 30. What? I thought you were going to go ahead with, no? You just said unfinished business? No. Sure. Why are I mean, you looking at me? Well, I'm, looking at, I'm looking, I mean, I was trying to get consensus from everyone, but oh, I, I didn't well, hear just though, so we'll do that. So we'll go, uh, we'll jump ahead uh, to item eight. Uh, is there any unfinished business? Yeah. No unfinished business. Okay. Uh, any new business? I see none. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Any future agenda items? All right, Miss uh, Brown. 
I'd like to have an update on the public-private uh, partnership for the next meeting. You will. Yeah, per the stipulation of the of the uh, what the legislature passed, um, the Board of Education, the commissioners, and the delegation will receive uh, a brief of the final recommendation from that group. So um, that will be done, um, hopefully done. It's, we have until the end of the calendar year, but seeing as how everyone goes away, um, <laughs> it'll, it'll be on the uh, presented at the next meeting. Anything else? All right. Dr. Sorry. Navarro, is this where you want me to um, present the proposal for the closure of religious holidays? Or? Um, so I, I would advise the, the board chair, um, but the item has been presented. Okay. Um, so Sorry. do you want to advise on maybe future agenda items? <coughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I gave sufficient time. I kind of looked a, a few times to see if anyone had comments on, on the calendar. And um, I, we, we went past that on the agenda. Um, it, it will come up. Um, it has to come up again before the board if there's something you'd like to discuss at that time. Okay. Okay. I can circle back with you. Okay. All right. Anything else? Then now we'll go on break until yeah. we'll be back at 4 30. <laughs> Thanks, pal. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, our, uh, our favorite time is when we uh, get to recognize great students and staff in our school system. We have some extra special um, recognitions and celebrations today. So we're going to start with that. Um, Mr. Conley, if you could, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Lucas, board members, and Dr. Navarro. The first recognition on the board's agenda today is for a group of students and staff from North Point High School who administered life-saving first aid to a teacher who was experiencing a medical emergency. To provide you with more details and to introduce these honorees, it's my privilege to introduce the principal of North Point High School, Mr. Daniel Capel. On September 30th, during our activity period, our sophomore welding students were playing basketball in the welding yard. Their welding instructor, Mr. Frank Holliday, joined in on the game. Soon after the game began, Mr. Holliday moved out of play. Attempting to sit down, he slouched down and fell over. His students immediately acted. While a couple of students stayed with Mr. Holliday, another called the main office for administration and the school nurse, nurse to report to the area. The remaining students ran to three different classrooms alerting Mr. Charlie Birch, Mr. Craig Patterson, and Mrs. Sandra Fair. Mr. Patterson immediately called 911. Mr. Birch and Ms. Fair began applying the beginning stages of care for Mr. Holliday. Assistant principal, principals, Mr. Pascarella and Mr. Corey Dobbins, Mr. Carl Pascarella and Mr. Corey Dobbins entered the classroom just before nurse Lisa Bazare and I arrived. Mr. Birch had already begun administering, administering CPR. Nurse Basare quickly addressed the situ assessed the situation and called for an AED. Mr. Holliday was not breathing and had no pulse. I ran from the welding room to the pool area to get an AED and the assistance of Ms. Amy Robinson and Ms. Rebecca Calatrulio. Ms. Robinson and Ms. Calatrulio lead the CPR and first aid trainings for CCPS administrators and coaches. Both quickly made their way to the welding yard. In fact, Ms. Robinson climbed a wall to get to the scene quicker. Once on the scene, Ms. Robinson prepared the, and attached the AED, and she and Ms. Calatrulio took over CPR for Mr. Birch and Nurse Basare. Mr. Patterson, Mr. Dobbins, and Mr. Pascarella secured the area, making sure EMTs could easily access the area. At the time, more help arrived. School Resource Officer Tiffany Smith arrived and assisted with providing CPR. While staff provided care, Ms. Christina Jones, arrived at the classroom and assisted Mr. Dobbins with making sure all students were safe and had ac access to support from our student services team. 
By this time, Mr. Victor Woodland was at the roadside to direct emergency services to the site. Multiple emergency respondents arrived on site. Due to the quality of care being provided by North Point High School staff, they did not interrupt the care being provided. Instead, they began preparing their equipment to take care and transport Mr. Holiday to the hospital. Eventually, emergency personnel took over the life-saving measures for Mr. Holiday and transported him to the ambulance. Before the ambulance left the school, we received amazing news. Mr. Holiday had a pulse and had resumed breathing. I'd like to take a moment to thank the leadership of Charles County Public Schools. We're very fortunate to work at a school district that requires administrators and coaches to be CPR certified and first aid trained and certified with AEDs readily available. Our trainings and resources made a difference on September 30th. In total, this event lasted under 30 minutes. Those minutes are some of the most intense moments I've ever witnessed. I am proud of what our staff was able to accomplish during such a short period of time that seemed to last so long. While I appreciate the praise as being shared with my students and my staff, the best part of the story is being able to stand next to Mr. Frank Holiday today. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the students who assisted. Do we? Yes. Should we go up there? Yeah. Mr. Capel, Commissioner uh, Coates and Commissioner Balling are also here and they're going to join us as well. Jacob Burris. Jordan Daniel. Dylan Farmer. Davion Gross. Christian Holland. Chad Jackson. Jabari McFadden. Dayron Scott. Joseph Smith. Larry Swan. <laughs> William Thomas. <laughs> and now for our staff. Nurse Lisa Bazare. Charles Birch. Rebecca Calatrulio.
Corey Dobbins. Sandra Fair. Christina Jones. Carl Pascarella. Amy Robinson. Officer Tiffany Smith. Victor Woodland. That's actually yeah. Yeah. All right. the man, the legend. All right. OK. Next. On our, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the only person in the building that could do it.
I bought a guitar from him. Yeah. 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 Okay, so next in our list of recognition um, is a group of folks uh, that organized an event, and Mr. Tim Bodemer is going to talk to us about that. A little itty bitty event. No. Just yeah, just <laughs> nothing. Just <laughs> um, I'm going to do the part that I'm horrible with first, and I can talk all day, but I hate pronouncing names, so we're going to do that first and get that out of the way. So in front of you, not in this particular order, you have. Mr. Keith Grasso, uh, Sarah Payne, Tabitha Caldwell, Dakota Baldwin, Jackie Coat, or Coat, yeah, and then Gekote, and then that's why I hate names. Uh, and um, where was it? Jessica Zaldo, Zaldo, is it Zaldo? There you go. So <laughs> you have the businesses. You have um, Community Bank of Chesapeake, Scary Strokes, Mediterranean. Uh, see, I told you I would do that. Meridian Fitness. Club and All American Harley Davidson. All right. You have basically the chair, vice chair of um, Rocktoberfest. So I really, me before I start, for uh, Keith and Sarah, the amount of work that those two put in to have it canceled. Um, <laughs> but, and it's not just been this year. So um, we've been doing this from a $1,500 donation to the school the first year to a $60,000 donation the last time we had the event, which was 25 years ago, it seems like, <laughs> but yeah. right before um, COVID hit. Um, <clears throat> if you've not been to the event, it is an amazing community event with bands, basically three to four different stages set up, uh, vendors set up, and bands rotating all day long on stages, playing for the community. Um, we have families coming out all day. We have activities for the kids. And by we, they have activities all set up. Um, the La Plata Band has played there in the past, marching band and jazz band. Um, St. Charles's jazz band has played earlier in the day. It's been to the point where I'm in the community and people are asking me if we're going to be doing it again. Um, especially coming out of COVID this year would have been an amazing show, um, except the hurricane had another <laughs> idea. So, but we are very much thankful for all of the donations that have come in over the years. And just to, people ask me what I spend the money on, and it's not that easy because we have so many different pots of money that we can pull from, but the money that we get from Rocktoberfest from our MSDE grant, Title IV grant, ESSER money, and our general fund here. Oh, ready? Here we go. Instruments for students in financial need, so that we've been continually adding to our instrument library. Art uh, supplies to enhance classroom instruction. Purchase additional art frames for local exhibits. We've purchased online theater resources uh, that provide students with access to hundreds of, actually thousands of scripts and other uh, theater resources that would not otherwise be available to them. One of my favorites, ukuleles. Uh, <laughs> we're adding that to our elementary general music uh, program. Access to smart music, which is one of the best programs um, and that actually got us through the pandemic um, so that the students would have access to that from home on their one-to-one -one devices. Then we've purchased uh, basically the Adobe Suite, but a different version for all of our multimedia courses. We've started adding MIDI interfaces to our class pianos, uh, class piano classes, so that we can get digital music composition um, added so that the students are able to do that. Plus, with Peace Help, we've been able to make it so that they can plug in electric guitars, vocals, so they can basically do all their own recording in school. Um, and there's other software. And then one of the best parts is we've been able to hire clinicians to come in and work with our students and our teachers to provide classroom um, instruction 
doing that with partnership with the Charles County Arts Alliance, but this money helps make that happen as well as the money that we get from our general fund. <coughs> that's just some of it. Talking to other uh, supervisors across the state, I can tell you this county is very, very well funded as far as the different programs and a number of things that we have going on, and it's through <coughs> events like this, even though I don't bank on having that because weather is weather, but the amount of extra things that this money brings and puts on in front of our students and our teachers has been amazing. Um, I personally would like to thank all of them for the donations that their companies have been doing, but also just the amount of time and energy that they've been putting in. And I know Mr. Lucas and Ms. Abel is also come in and help for the event, as do many of our teachers. Um, and they were all signed up to do it again this year. So hopefully we'll be able to continue this. It's a great community event. And you want to go ahead and do your, you get to, you want to present or you want the boss to present, Sarah? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bowden, remember before, so you mentioned, you mentioned all the fine companies here. We'll mention them again, Community Bank of the Chesapeake, Meridian Fitness, mm -hmm. uh, Scary Strokes. These two folks here from Island Music and Sanders Insurance, like you said, a lot of time and a lot of resources, and just want to thank you for that. It really means a lot. Thank and the you. list of, you said there's 60 sponsors? Yeah. Okay. So we would go through yeah. 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 a lot, but we know there's space limitations. So, um, and it's, when I say it's a community event, I mean, that's what I mean. When you have 60 corporate spo or sponsors, we have just people who are donating, companies that are donating, it's <coughs> really, a great thing so I appreciate it you want to do your presentation cool. <laughs> so even though we didn't have the event this year mm -hmm. um, they would like to make a donation to uh, Charles County Public Schools fund and performing arts program so you can go ahead yeah. feels good to be back I think the last <laughs> time I stood here was 2019 when we gave our last donation um, it feels like it's been 25 years. Uh, I want to take a minute to thank all of our sponsors, all the folks that are here with us and all the folks that couldn't be here. Um, this year we had an amazing amount of sponsors. We had roughly 60 folks uh, all the way from our local businesses to this year we had national sponsorships, which was pretty exciting. Um, this year was keyed up to be the best Rocktoberfest ever, uh, and I can control everything but the weather. <laughs> However, we would still like to make a sizable donation to the Charles County uh, Performing and Arts Department. So we would like to be able to present today this big check. Before you turn it around, we can all come up front, board. Yeah, I do it. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, so now we've got some students that evidently have done some great things. And Ms. Gill, you're up? Yes. All right, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Board Chairperson Lucas, Board Members, Dr. Navarro, and staff. Today it is my honor to turn the spotlight onto several very personable <laughs> Charles County Public School students who have been identified by their school principals as exemplary student models in the areas of academic achievement, personal responsibility, and career readiness. Students being recognized this afternoon are Blake Hancock, 12th grader from Henry E. Lackey High School, Amaya Ford, 8th grader from John Hansen Middle School, Dwayne Washington, 5th grader from C. Paul Barnhart Elementary School, Ayana Rozier, 5th grader from Dr. Gustavus Brown Elementary School, and Austin Gerald, fifth grader from T.C. Martin Elementary School. These outstanding students will be recognized in this order by their school principals. Kathy Perillo, principal at Henry E. Lackey High School. Benjamin Colehorse, principal at John Hanson Middle School. Dr. Brian King, principal at C. Paul Barnhart Elementary School. Karen Lewis, principal at Dr. Gustavus Brown Elementary School. And Todd Wonderling, principal at T.C. Martin Elementary School. Ms. Perillo. Achievement is defined as a great accomplishment, something achieved with great effort or skill. At Henry E. Lackey High School, we define great as it relates to growth, relationships, excellence, accountability, and teamwork. Therefore, it is with great charger pride I present senior Blake Hancock as the exemplary student in the area of academic achievement. Blake's academic capabilities are never understated. He's ranked in the top 10 of his class and is enrolled in six advanced placement classes. He's the president of the National Honor Society and Key Club and the founding president of the Environmental Club. Blake is a member of the ITS Academic and Math Teams, Student Government Association, and Fellowship of Christian Athletes. During the pandemic when schools were closed or on a hybrid schedule, Blake enrolled at the College of Southern Maryland under their gifted and talented program for online classes. Though he excels in all subjects, he has an exceptional aptitude for math and took AP Calculus last year as a junior. Now the stage has been set, and I'd like to further explain why Blake was selected for the recognition since we have so many outstanding chargers. He has always earned straight A's, and he's taken a total of 12 advanced placement classes. It's obvious that Blake's academic prowess would put him at the very top of his class. However, that's not necessarily the case. One would think he'd be ranked at one or two um, in his graduating class, but mathematically, it's impossible. When Blake enrolled in our Air Force ROTC, JROTC program four years ago, he knew that the classes he would take would not be weighted and therefore would not propel him to that rank or position, no pun intended. Three, two years ago, or even this summer, Blake could easily have abandoned his role in JROTC to improve his position in that top 10, but he did not. He chose to be true to himself and pursue his interest in military science, ultimately achieving the rank of deputy group commander, a role he takes very seriously. Blake's approach is the greatest example of not only academic achievement, but achievement at all levels. 
Blake plans to attend a major university next year and study biochemistry while enrolled in their ROTC program. I present the great Henry E. Lackey Charger, Blake Hancock. is from Mr. Colehorse, principal at John Hansen Middle School. Good evening. From the moment you meet Amaya, you're a witness to a humble, hardworking, and driven student at John Hansen Middle School. Listening to the teacher's comments about her, you gain a real sense of the type of student she is and how she conducts herself at school every day. Amaya is an excellent student. She has an amazing work ethic. She participates in class, asks questions to ensure she understands content. She goes above and beyond what is asked and is always polite. Also, we both love to play Hamilton. <laughs> Amaya is a fantastic student and clarinetist. She regularly is researching extra music and learning it on her own time. This year, she made third chair at All County Band. I'm very proud of her and look forward to seeing what she will accomplish in the future. Amaya attends my eighth grade science class. In class, she's exceptional in the area of scientific inquiry and also presents herself as a professional in class every day. Her professionalism extends to both behavior and interest in learning the subject matter. When Amaya told me she was to study and eventually become a psychologist, I have no doubt in my mind she would eventually accomplish her goal. Looking to the future, I cannot imagine there being any other uh, than kindness, positivity, and high achievement in the classroom. Her devotion, her devotion to learning has led to be a leader among her peers in content knowledge, and she's an absolute delight to have in my class. Amaya is a great student all around. She is smart, has problem-solving skills, critical thinking, open-mindedness, and then she is incredible. She is kind, caring, works well with other classmates, especially in small group setting. Amaya is well-rounded. She's a member of the National Junior Honor Society Student Government Association, plays sports while maintaining her grades. Lastly, Amaya is very social among her peers. She's able to form and sustain positive relationships. She's able to experience, manage, and express her emotions and concern and is very engaged in her environment. Amaya is a model student. She's a straight A student during her time at John Hansen. As stated before, she's a member of our Student Government Association, the National Junior Honor Society, Outside of school, she participates in the Girl Scouts and the Minority Scholars. When I asked her about her future, she expressed a desire for politics and law and wants to be a member of the House of Representatives. Amai indicated that she wanted to influence society and create a positive change in the world. A humble spirit, but a fire on the inside. It is my pleasure to present to the board from John Hanson Middle School in the area of academic achievement, Amaya Ford. Principal from C. Paul Barnhart Elementary School, Dr. Brian King. Good evening. I am proud to present Dwayne Washington, a fifth grade student at C. Paul Barnhart Elementary School, for recognition in the area of personal responsibility. Dwayne is a student leader and makes daily contributions to school safety and class discussions. He is a member of our safety patrol, and he explains that he wanted to join the patrol because he likes to help other people stay safe and secure. He has also shown personal responsibility and persistence in his commitment to learn how to play the saxophone. He reports that he practices every day and even makes extra practice time on the weekends. The fifth grade teachers report that Duane has a great sense of humor and that he is always ready and eager to give maximum effort in class, especially in class discussions and debates. Outside of school hours, he enjoys playing football for the St. Charles Bears, loves to fish for catfish and rock bass at Bud's Creek, <laughs> and loves playing with his brothers and sisters. Duane's parents report that he is an amazing older brother always showing patience and care toward his younger siblings. 
Dwayne has ambitions to attend and play football at Florida State University. <laughs> His easygoing disposition and positive mindset are sure to lead him on a series of continual successes and accomplishments in the future. This has been a busy and exciting day for him as he was honored at our first quarter character trait breakfast this morning for showing grit in the classroom. I am happy to present Dwayne Washington as Barnhart's outstanding student for recognition and personal responsibility. Congratulations, Dwayne. Ms. Karen Lewis. It is my pleasure to recognize Ayana Rozier as a fifth grade student who's being recognized for academic, I'm sorry, for college and career readiness. I asked a few of her teachers um, what they thought about Ayana, and they had some wonderful things to share. The fifth grade team says, Ayana is a model student and citizen at Dr. Brown Elementary School. She is dedicated to her learning and academic achievement. She's attentive, participates in class discussion, and is very helpful to her friends and peers. Ayana puts forth great, eff great effort towards her assignments, but she is more known as a person who is willing to help others. She's a role model to her peers, and it doesn't surprise them when she shares that she wants to pursue a career that helps her community. Her fourth grade teacher shared that it was a pleasure to have Ayana in the class. She loved being challenged, and she worked hard and diligently as she persevered through the reading and math curriculum for, for the um, gifted students. She con continuously earned principal honor roll every quarter in fourth grade. She absolutely loves to learn and it shows in everything that she does. She is such a bright student and has a bright personality. She's well liked by her peers and she's willing to always help her struggling students, struggling classmates, excuse me, whether it's academically, physically, or just to share a kind word of encouragement. Ayana participates in several extracurricular activities. She's a part of MESA, DI, and she usually um, participates in the annual Spelling Bee. She's a great artist, and she is learning to speak Korean. <laughs> and <clears throat> the teacher says, I'm not sure what Ayana wants to choose to do as her future goal, but it, whatever she does, she'll be great at it and she'll be an asset to any career. But I'm hoping that she chooses to be a teacher in the future because Charles County Pub Public Schools can use a Miss Rozier in the future. <laughs> <laughs> when asked, Ayana shared a little bit of her goals for the future. She says, my name is Ayana Rozier. I'm a fifth grade student at Dr. Brown Elementary School. I've been a student here since kindergarten my future goal is to attend Rice University in Houston, Texas and major in architecture. My dream career is to be an architect and design buildings all over the world. I would like to build places that will help people like hospitals and universities. I prepare for my future by maintaining good grades in school and I participate in academic activities such as STEAM and playing virtual games that involve architecture and designing. This year, I am on the DI team. I plan to participate in MESA again. I also play the cello in the school orchestra, and I'm also a part of the Dr. Brown Spirit Squad. Outside of school, I participate in church activities, Zumba, and the neighborhood cleanups, <laughs> which keeps me busy. When I have free time, I enjoy playing outside, doing arts and crafts, reading graphic novels, watching TV, and especially watching anime and reading about the bad boy, the bad guy series. 
It is my <laughs> pleasure to um, introduce to you Ayana Rosia as um, a student who is recognized for college and career readiness. They all have very big personalities, I'll tell you. Um, and I'd like to introduce Mr. Wonderling, principal at T.C. Martin Elementary School. Austin Jarrell is a fifth grade student at T.C. Martin Elementary School and is being recognized in the area of academic achievement. Austin has attended T.C. Martin Elementary School since first grade. He was identified for gifted services in second grade. Austin has been on principal's honor roll every quarter since third grade. He enjoys reading, especially books that include superheroes in action. Though he has a love, or though, uh, though he has a love of reading, Austin feels that math is his best subject. He continues to receive gifted services for both reading and math. A goal Austin created at the beginning of this school year was to get all A's in fifth grade. The reason for this is because he has never gotten lower than an A in any subject area since he has began school. Teachers describe Austin as having a quiet but strong spirit and is always helpful to his peers and teachers. Teachers are amazed with the way he recalls details and is able to use details to answer questions. He is a leader at T.C. Martin and is always responsible, respectful, and ready to learn, which is our pledge. Austin gives maximum effort, shows grit, and is a great team member. Austin constantly encourages the people around him and models hard work. He is a leader in math and reading groups and isn't afraid to try and answer the most difficult of questions. He was chosen as a safety patrol member, which models the Tiger Pledge for all other students. Also, he's part of the math team that took third place last year. His peers describe him as non-judgmental, very kind and smart, always trying to help people, a role model in fifth grade, and competitive. One peer told me a story of a student who was getting picked on because of a speech issue they had. Austin heard about this and asked the student to play with him at recess just to show him his support. The demeanor of the student totally changed due to his kindness, and he knew he had a friend in Austin. Austin describes himself as athletic, fast, strong, smart, and energetic. His favorite song lyrics are, you only get one shot, do not miss your chance to blow, this opportunity comes once in a lifetime. <laughs> Wrestling, play football, and lacrosse leagues. Austin's favorite superhero is Iron Man because he just loves all the tech stuff. <laughs> In his free time, Austin enjoys going to amusement parks to ride roller coasters, read action books, and watch superhero movies. For all these reasons, Austin is more than worthy of being recognized for academic achievement and much, much more. Congratulations, Austin. <laughs> So, quite an impressive group down there. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, Blake, six AP classes, huh? Yes, sir. How many hours you sleep a night? <laughs> like, eh. Surprisingly enough. Uh, well, good on you. That, that is a lot of hard work. And I, I couldn't write as fast um, as your principal was, was ticking off all the clubs and things that you're president of. But I got National Honor Society Key Club, founding member and president of the Environmental Club. Um, can't say enough about um, what it takes to, to be a leader and, and to set an example for your fellow students. And the fact that you, that you went into JROTC and you knew that it would take you out, and we hear the story a lot, that, that shows what, how much character you have because it's what you wanted to do. And um, you want to be in biochemistry, interestingly enough, that's what my son majored in, so good on you. Where do you want to go to school, do you know? I'm not sure yet. Yeah. I mean, you still got time to decide. That's good. Um, but uh, just continue doing what you're doing. You should be very proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Amaya, how are you? I'm 
I'm good. How are you doing? I am great. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, um, and you stood there as, as your principal read about all the great things that you did and, and kept using the word humble and, and could just see that in, in, your, in, in the way your, your demeanor. And that's um, very uncommon for someone your age. And you should be very, very proud of that. But you're driven. You have a strong work ethic. And uh, you work well with other people. And, again, that's something that you can't learn young enough. Uh, everyone pay attention to that. Um, can't get through life doing it all on your own. You gotta, you gotta work with people. That's very important. And what kind of sports do you like to do? Um, I like to run track. I also like to play basketball outside of school. Nice. Well, what, what, what's your, what's your event in track you li that you like the most? Like what I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I run long distance. I'd say. Oh, good, good. That I can relate to. I'm not so fast, but I can run a long time. <laughs> good on you. Well, keep up the great work. Thank, Thank you very much. Twain, how are you? There's that smile. It took like two seconds. <laughs> two seconds. Uh, Sue, so you play the saxophone. Yes. Want to hear a bad joke? What, what, what do you call a cow that plays the saxophone? Oh, what do you call it? A musician? <laughs> yeah. All right, so. But, um, yeah, it was terrible. Thank you. That, that's called a dad joke. That's called a dad joke. Yeah. <laughs> but what your principal said about you is that you're a student leader and like your uh, companions up there, you like to help other people. And um, you have a good life balance. You like to play football. I like to fish. I looked over and I saw Miss Abel there when you said that. So good on you. And uh, do, you, do you, re you release most of the stuff or do you keep the fish once in a while? So sometimes I release, sometimes I keep. There, good answer, good answer. It's a nice one, you keep it. Nothing wrong with that. Well, congratulations. Be very proud of yourself. Ayana, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, thank you very much for asking. Um, the first thing that I wrote down, model student and citizen. It doesn't get much better than that. And then when your principal said you're willing to help others, you, you turned and you smiled at her. I don't know if you even knew that you did that, but <laughs> that, that obviously is something that makes you feel pretty good, and um, you should be proud of that. Don't ever stop doing that. Principal's Honor Roll and in a bunch of clubs, Mesa and DI, and boy, learning Korean, you don't hear that too much. No? Do you like it? Yeah, it's a yeah? very nice language in my opinion. Oh, very good. <laughs> wow. And then, you know, I... If you could have given me 50 guesses about what you wanted to do, I don't think architect would have been in, in one of my guesses. But then the reason that she said is you want to build things to help people. And so that's a reoccurring theme. So, yeah, you can smile at yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Austin, how are you? Mr. All A's, Austin. That's what I heard there. <laughs> so, and we practiced the three R's, correct? Which are? Um, math. Yeah, R the three R's? Responsibility. Uh, res respectful, res respectful, responsible, and ready to learn. There we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and you're on the math team. And again, you were, you were identified as a role model for your students and what you did for your one friend there. Mm -hmm. that, that is straight up awesome. And you and I have something to come. You like roller coasters. Yes. Yeah, I don't like them as much as I used to because they don't <laughs> like me too much. But um, I love doing that. So um, uh, any ideas what you want to do when you get older? Not yet. Yeah, well, come on. I don't blame you. You're fifth grade. You like, like to play video games and, and read a lot. So that's good. Don't ever stop reading. <laughs> so congratulations. Again, be proud of what you've accomplished. You, you've earned it. So now I've talked a little about you. We're going to start down here, and you can uh, say a few words if you wish. Blake? I want to start off by saying thank you to Ms. Perello for this nomination. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. However, I wouldn't be here without the support of my family, especially my mom and dad, who are here today as well. <laughs> this award is not only a reflection of my hard work, but the hard work of my peers, teachers, school administrators, and my family support, who have all allowed me to excel the past few years. 
I want to end this with a congratulation to everyone that is here today. And thank you for Charles County Public Schools, their dedication to every student's um, academic and personal achievement. Okay. Thank you. Maya? So I want to begin by thanking all the teachers that have nominated me for this position. And it's very humbling to feel the integrity and compassion all my teachers have for all the students at my school, John Hansen. Um, Charles County is a comfort county compared to where I'm from. It's like, it's been made clear to me that Charles County is very family oriented and very personalized with everyone's experience. That's how my experience came out for me and I was very glad about it. Like the first day I walked through my school's doors building, like I was welcomed. I felt um, like the Hansen's staff and faculty were very like warm hearted. And I feel like all my life, my mom has been the muscle that has pushed me further and further to reach this success like this. Yeah, since I was a toddler, she's exposed me to activities and cultures that I grew into and grew into the interest of it. And eventually I just built off of that. And ultimately God has been my hope and encouragement all my life and continues to be. Wow, well said. <laughs> Dwayne top that. I would like to thank my parents for raising me for who I am today. I feel awarded for all the hard work I have done over the years. I would like to thank all the teachers at Barnhart for being kind and helping me and the other students. I am very happy that I have made a mark on Barnhart. Okay. Well said. <laughs> Thank you, parents. Thank you very much. Ayana. Um, I would first like to say how happy I am to be here today because I would <coughs> I would also like to thank Ms. Lewis <laughs> because I really would not be here today. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would also like to thank all my family members. <laughs> no, only <laughs> four of them are here today. So I would like to thank them all very much because they all helped me and they all just sat there and cared for me every time I was down and really needed help. And then I would also like to thank all of my teachers that I've had because they were all sitting there just helping everybody and being very caring for everybody and being caring for all the teachers as well. That's all I have to say. I don't <laughs> have to say that. Thank you. Austin? So I would just like to say thank you to my parents for raising me to this point and my teachers for teaching me to get to this point. And that's really all I have to say. <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple of little things for you and we're gonna take some pictures. So just sit tight for a second. And everyone's going to shake your hand and wish you congratulations. Thank you. Keep up the good work, okay? Thank you. <laughs> 
Duration. They really are.
Dr. Navarro, board members, executive staff, colleagues, friends, and family. My name is Teresa Cook from Human Resources, and today we will be acknowledging six exemplary employees. Our first recipient is Mr. Kevin Gibson, a social studies teacher at Henry E. Lackey High School, represented by Principal Kathy Perello. GREAT is an acronym for Growth, Relationships, Excellence, Accountability, and Teamwork. <laughs> Teacher, leader, and colleague Kevin Gibson personifies the GREAT philosophy, which embodies our core values and mission at Henry E. Lackey High School. G is for Growth. Mr. Gibson began his, nine years, his career nine years ago at Henry E. Lackey High School as a novice social studies teacher. In addition to teaching local, state, and national government and U.S. history classes, Mr. Gibson teaches psychology and sociology, advanced placement psychology, and yearbook. His instruction is intently designed to be authentic and personalized. His psychology and yearbook classes boast the most in-school field trip experiences as he and his students are often in the hallways either observing or capturing human behavior at its best. R stands for relationships. Mr. Gibson is an attentive, proactive, and professional EACC representative for our school. And he is always tactful and discretionary in his discourse and actions, yielding a level of trust that is highly respected by administration and his colleagues. E represents excellence. Mr. Gibson is never content with mediocrity. His expectations are high for his students and for himself. Mr. Gibson immerses himself in the daily operations of the school and extracurricular life. He has spent countless hours chronicling and capturing the highlights of our student and staff charger family. He recently completed his master's degree in administration from Towson University. While completing his internship, he created and formatted a standardized syllabus for our staff to use, which helped our new teachers this year. A is for accountability. Mr. Gibson is in the Maryland Army National Guard Reserves. And while deployed overseas last year, he continued to monitor the progress of his students and met with them via Zoom, mm -hmm. even though there is a time differential. He also distributes yearbooks to students and their families over the summer, being dutifully responsible for all aspects of his school roles. And finally, T is for teamwork. Mr. Gibson works inclusively and not in isolation. Students and staff would say he is firm, but fair, realistic, but relatable, but more importantly, irreplaceable. Though Mr. Gibson will often hijack the morning announcements and do a much better job than I can do, or try to capture me in the most unflattering picture possible for the yearbook, there is no greater person more deserving of this recognition. It is with great Charger pride I present Mr. Kevin Gibson. Our next recipient is Ms. Donna Clark, a special education instructional assistant and in inclusion at St. Charles High School, represented by assistant principal Jason Mackey.
Good evening, Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chairperson Wilson, board members, Superintendent Navarro, staff, students, and guests. My name is Jason Mackey, and I'm an assistant principal at St. Charles High School. Tonight, I am here to share remarks for Mrs. Little, principal of St. Charles High School, and our students and staff. On behalf of St. Charles students and staff, it is my pleasure to present to you this evening, Mrs. Clark, our exemplary employee of the year. Mrs. Clark is a dedicated staff member who regularly goes above and beyond for our students, staff, and community. When you think about the attributes of an exemplary employee, many qualities come to mind. An exemplary employee is someone who is dependable. In addition to her outstanding attendance and her tireless work ethic, Mrs. Clark is somebody who always volunteers at events and takes on leadership roles within our school. Most recently, Mrs. Clark asked to serve as the instructional assistant with our returning ESOL students and works to ensure there is a seamless transition for our students. An exemplary employee collaborates with others and understands the value of teamwork. Mrs. Clark has pulled various groups together to initiate, plan, and facilitate events for our students and staff. She co-founded Girls Empowerment a group that focuses on providing female students with the confidence and tools necessary to succeed in life. Mrs. Clark is also our Relay for Life coordinator. Her hard work and passion for this cause has earned her the position of on-site county coordinator for Relay for Life. An exemplary employee is dedicated to others. To say Mrs. Clark is dedicated to her job diminishes all that she gives to the St. Charles community. Mrs. Clark can be seen attending events um, during the evening and weekends, spearheading our concession stand, decorating the school to create a welcoming environment for all, and serving our families behind the scenes. Most important is Ms. Clark's dedication to the belief that the Spartan nation will continue to thrive when we all come together for the sole purpose of the students, the staff, and the community. While our contributions in the classroom are important and most deserving of recognition, it is her support of the school community as a whole that is most impactful. Mrs. Clark greatly enriches our St. Charles School community, and we are better because of the love and the dedication that she gives each and every day. Thank you, Mrs. Clark for all of the support that you provide St. Charles High School. Our next exemplary employee is Ms. Latia Ballard, a social studies teacher at John Hansen Middle School, represented by Principal Benjamin Colhurst. All right, I just want to open up with saying, I don't know if I have the words of respect and admiration for this person to my right. Um, we met in a gym in St. Charles High School in 2018 when there was vacancies galore and every principal's looking for the best candidates and we found her and she's ours. <laughs> she's going to remain ours. <laughs> so what she is for me now is whenever anyone drops by unannounced, we say, well, let's go see what Miss Ballard's doing down in her room. <laughs> she's amazing at what she does. I challenge anybody to come in and watch what she does each and every day because you're going to sit down and watch in awe of a professional teacher interact with her students. <laughs> here's, what, uh, here's what my staff had to say about Ms. Ballard. Fact, I tried to get my middle school child to come to Hanson just so she could have Ms. Ballard. Ms. Ballard does an incredible job of creating community of learning that supports every student. Her lessons are built so that history is relevant to students in the class. As I walked through her class yesterday, I heard her teaching that we are a product of history of the past and what we do today will determine who we are in the future. Students instill this ideology and work with her to become a better version of themselves. I love Miss Ballard. <laughs> Miss Ballard's exemplary in everything she does. She creates relationships of caring and a learning atmosphere of respect. 
Her lessons are engaging and innovative. Her use of technology and how it can be better learning uh, goes way beyond everyday technology integration in the classroom. She makes her uh, lessons relevant for the modern student. Her knowledge of history and social studies and her passion for content is evident in everything she does. She is truly an amazing teacher. She's insightful. She share, shares ways to improve uh, learning for our students. She's hands-on, provides different avenues for our diverse needs of students. Um, I love how enthusiastic she is and sees the quality of work and she's able to pull from all of her students. She has high expectations, yet she meets them where they're at. She engages them in real-life discu uh, discussions. Since Ms. Ballard has come to John Hanson, she's been on the eighth grade team, I can attest for what an asset she is. She brought with her a wealth of experience, especially with technology. She was so beneficial during the pandemic. I know her use of technology personally inspired me to raise my standards during virtual learning, even though I teach math, not social studies. She's an excellent, excellent professional model for a great mentor for young teachers. She's been instrumental in creating consistent approaches to discipline and situation. She's always willing to give back from a student who's having a bad day and needs an alternate place to work. She always has suggestions when you have a problem and addresses our team concerns with administration. Ms. Ballard is beyond this world beautiful. More than help, more than a professional, you can learn from her for just about anything, especially your classroom structures and strategies are sound. She loves to reel you in with her Southern fair cuisine <laughs> and known to try out of the box escape rooms to help students dive even deeper into content. Truly a historian at heart who gives you content and context. When you encounter, encounter Ms. Ballard, you will develop a love for learning, school, and appreciation that great teachers still do exist. All right, we're gonna roll. <laughs> well, I have the room. This nomination is just the first. We're rolling Ms. Ballard into Charles County Teacher of the Year, and I promise you, she will not disappoint us. <laughs> Our next exemplary employee is Ms. Devani Farrar, a second grade teacher from C. Bar Barnhart Elementary School, represented by Principal Dr. Brian King. It is my pleasure to present Ms. Devani Farrar, a second grade teacher at Barnhart Elementary School. Ms. Farrar is being recognized for her outstanding work ethic and for her professional growth. After attending the University of Memphis on a track scholarship and graduating magna cum laude, That's right. <laughs> Ms. Farrar joined the Barnhart team as a conditionally certified teacher. She's a lifetime Maryland resident and attended Charles County schools during some of her elementary and middle school years. During her first five years of teaching, She's been able to balance the demands of taking several graduate level classes at a time while also executing the responsibilities of a classroom teacher. This is truly an impressive accomplishment. She will soon be finishing her master's degree from the Notre Dame of Maryland University. When asked about why she chose to commit to a career in public schools, she stated that she has a passion for the kids and wants to show them that anything is doable as long as you work hard. Ms. Farrar's hard work and commitment to her students has led her to successfully transition from a conditionally certified teacher to a highly effective, fully credentialed educator. In contrast to the headlines about teacher shortages and retention challenges, Ms. Farrar is an outstanding example of a high quality teacher candidate working hard to enter the profession and to gain the credentials necessary to make a career of teaching. She is truly making a difference in the quality of education offered to Barnhart students. Her students say that she is a great teacher and that she is ready each day to help them get ready for third grade. Her contributions to teaching and learning are worthy of recognition and celebration. Congratulations, Ms. Farrar. Our next exemplary employee is
is Miss Tina Thomas, a registration secretary from Dr. Gustavus Brown Elementary School, represented by Principal Karen Lewis. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Tina Thomas and um, present her as an exemplar employee at Dr. Gustavus Brown Elementary School. Ms. Thomas has been employed at Dr. Brown Elementary for 16 years. She is our irreplaceable registration secretary. And if you come to Dr. Brown on any day, you'll find Ms. Thomas sitting behind the front desk with a smile on her face, ready to greet all the students, the parents, and the staff. On any day, you can ask Ms. Thomas any question about where a child lives or how they're getting home, and she will know. <laughs> Ms. Thomas' tasks are never ending in the front office. She's our synergy coordinator. She helps teachers input students' data and grades in the system on a daily basis. She teaches teachers, she instructs teachers how to correctly um, put in their daily attendance, and she assists staff in any other way that she possibly can, possibly can. Although she's very busy doing her assigned tasks, she is never too busy to help her students and staff. Ms. Thomas confronts all challenges head on. She continuously takes classes to increase her understanding of what is required of her in the front office. She completes all tasks with, with excellence, and she's willing to grow in any area that will improve her performance. When she's not busy at work, Ms. Thomas is a ASL volunteer and coordinator, and she also is a food and friends volunteer and contributor. So what are people saying about Ms. Thomas around Dr. Brown? Well, I asked. <laughs> Ms. Thomas knows our community, ask her any question about any student or family, and she knows. And if she doesn't know, she'll find out. She willingly volunteers to lend a hand in any task, calling a parent, blowing up balloons, finding files, or even finding a student. <laughs> she takes such good care of the staff and student at Dr. Brown because she truly loves us. Ms. Thomas is the mother hen of everyone in the school. She's on the front lines every day. She deals with parents. She celebrates students. She supports staff. We will not be able to survive without her. I could write a book about all the wonderful things Ms. Thomas does for Dr. Brown Elementary School, from keeping us safe to keeping us in line. I've heard Ms. Lewis say on many occasions, if Ms. Thomas says no, the answer is no. <laughs> Ms. Thomas is undoubtedly the heartbeat of Dr. Brown Elementary School. Without Ms. Thomas, many of us would not be able to get our job done to the level that we do every day. She not only takes care of the staff, but she keeps a prize box of treasures behind her desk for students who comes to the office that brings the attendance and notes from their teachers every day. Every year, she puts up a tree in the office and she hangs hats, scarves, and gloves on it and she tells the students to take whatever they need. She does this because she's our mom. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Tina Thomas as exemplar employee from Dr. Brown. Our last exemplary employee is Ms. Laura Liverman, a technology facilitator from T.C. Martin Elementary School, represented by Principal Todd Wonderling. All right, last but definitely not least, Laura Liverman has been with Charles County Public Schools for the past 27 years. She started her career as a classroom teacher at Eva Turner Elementary School, but has spent the last 19 years as a technology facilitator at T.C. Martin Elementary School. 
During her time at Martin, she has served as a bus coordinator, team leader, public relations social media rep, website manager, fifth grade safety patrol co-sponsor, and social media rep for the CTE program. During my time as her supervisor, Ms. Liverman has served as a highly effective teacher. Ms. Liverman is a problem solver who always asks relevant questions while developing solutions. She currently serves as a specials team leader and is the go-to person on that team. She serves at a, as a mentor in our school, but is also selected as a mentor for technology facilitators across the county. She is creative and thoughtful in the way she plans and delivers her technology lessons. Ms. Liverman works with all grade levels to see how her computer class can support the learning in the classroom while developing strong technology skills for even our youngest learners. Ms. Liverman always displays flexibility, which has been on display through a pandemic and a move to the transition school. She has genuine love for her community, students, and peers. When I asked her what her favorite thing was about T.C. Martin, she said, undoubtedly, the community, exclamation mark. The students, staff, and parents are the best in the county. Every one of them knows how fortunate they are to be at Martin. I don't just teach at Martin, I also live in the Martin community. I run into parents and students and former parents and former students all the time, and they love to stop and say hello and always have positive things to say about the school, the teachers, and their classmates. I would never want to teach anywhere else. Ms. Liverman is amazing in her role as public relations social media rep and website manager. If you see our Twitter site, at Tigers TC Martin, <laughs> you would be impressed with the way she posts the awesome moments that happen every day at Martin. Our community visits our site constantly to stay informed and keep updated on the teaching and learning going on at Martin. As a TC Martin community member, she takes great pride in keeping our site updated, informative, and creative for all to view. She has been especially important over the past four years during virtual learning and the re return of in-person learning. Ms. Liverman constantly came to me with ideas on how to use our Twitter and Facebook pages to keep our community connected to the T.C. Martin Elementary School staff and each other. Ms. Liverman has been part of the T.C. Martin community for most of her life as a community member, parent, and teacher. Her impact on our school and community is unquestionable. When I asked her what her favorite memory in education, she stated, a couple of years ago, I ran into a former student of mine at the grocery store. I didn't recognize him until he introduced himself. He was excited to tell me that he had become a teacher. He introduced me to his grandmother who was shopping with him and told her that I was one of the teachers that inspired him to become a teacher. A recent one that I, I just have to include, I was pushing my cart, yes, she's on a cart. Um, <laughs> I was pushing my cart out, out of a classroom where I had just taught and the classroom teacher asked her students, how was computers today? Just as I was starting to, started down the hall, I heard the students reply, it was awesome. This is just another sign to me of the impact Ms. Liverman has had on our school and community during her 19 years of service and beyond. On a personal note, this is my 10th board recognition. Now I'm presenting amazing Charles County staff members and once as an actual recipient. To this day, this is one of the highlights of my year and career. I remember clearly how humble it was to be recognized along with other amazing staff members across the county while sitting right over there where Ms. Liverman sits today. Uh, did, I'm sorry, I lost myself for a second. Uh, in my first year as principal of T.C. Martin Elementary School, I was so excited for our board recognition and the opportunity to recognize a staff member at my new school. You know who my nominee was for that year? Yes, Ms. Laura Liverman. Unfortunately, our date for this ceremony was in April, and everything seemed to come to a halt that year due to the most unprecedented time in public school history. It has kept me up at night that Ms. Liverman never got the experience, the feeling that I carry with me to this day from this event. Ms. Liverman, today is your day, and I am so proud to recognize you as the exemplary employee for T.C. Martin Elementary School. It's my pleasure to be here this evening to honor these employees, and I'd like to show a round of applause for all of them. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Um, all of you here, when the students were up here earlier, none of their success happens without you. So thank you. So Mr. Gibson, 
Um, again, I, I couldn't write as fast as all the classes you teach were being <laughs> dictated out. Um, but I, I am curious, there, there's a yearbook class, there's an actual class for yearbook, or is that at like a club? So it's a club and a class at the high school. Uh, we okay. teach it as a, a regular period. Wow. Wow. And uh, the, the, the pick of your, your principal, I'm, I'm sure that was only going to be used in case your observation score was on the low end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you're a building rep at your school, um, and, and you, you create a syllabus for new teachers, and great on you for that. Thank you very much for your service. And the fact that you're engaged while you're out of the country, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what speaks more loudly to your dedication to Charles County Public Schools. Uh, and you were quoted as being irreplaceable, and I can certainly see why. So thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Clark, how are you? Wonderful. Good. So, so I've heard. <laughs> well, I can see. Um, yeah, I've been to, uh, to your school a couple times, and I've seen you there. And you and a basket from me. I did. I yes, relay for did. relay, for, relay life. for life. Yes. I've used that basket. I'm glad I'm going to make another one this year. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I was going to mention the fact that you organized relay for life and a bunch of other events at the school, and and you're the heartbeat of the school community there. And and a, and a school in order to thrive is only a strong as the community around it and you help make that happen so thank you so much for doing that really appreciate it my spartan family yeah. <laughs> miss ballard how are you i'm fine and you thank you I, i'm doing well thank you um you teach history that is relevant, and I can only imagine in middle school trying to keep kids engaged and, and in a history class of all things, but the fact that, that they talk about how an amazing teacher you are, I mean, that, that just has to make you feel good. Um, you set high expectations, and uh, you're a model uh, and a mentor, as, as your, uh, your principal said, and, uh, but I wanna know, you. You, you cook, you cook Southern food. You bring it to school once in a while? Cause well, on Friday, I am going to bring my <laughs> Southern, I'm from South Carolina originally, I'm gonna bring my chicken perlo, which is a dish my father made and um, passed down to me. So we'll be having that. Well, wow, that's Friday. what a coincidence. <laughs> I was planning to come by your school on Friday. <laughs> so. and, and congratulations. <laughs> The, uh, the preemptive announcement that you're going to be submitted for Teacher thank of the Year, um, it, it is well deserved from everything thank that we've heard. So thank you so much for what you do for thank Charles you. County Public Schools. <laughs> Ms. Farrar, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm well, thank you so much. So, and uh, I'll say it, magna cum laude, the cheer. <laughs> we had a cheer before. And uh, University of Memphis, what did you run? Were well, you a track or field event? Um, track. I ran the four, two, and four by four. Wow. Okay. Those are fast things. I, I can't <laughs> do those things. So good for you. And you took, you came to work and you took grad classes while you were working. Did I hear that right? Yes. Just amazing. And now you are a highly effective teacher. So thank you so much uh, for your commitment to Charles County Schools. And when, you, when your students say that you're a great teacher, it doesn't get any better than that because Kids have no filters. They're going to tell you like it is. So <laughs> the fact <laughs> they say that about you speaks volumes to you and, and how you were raised. So thank you so much. <laughs> Miss Thomas, irreplaceable. I heard that a couple times, irreplaceable. Um, and you're the synergy coordinator. So that's one of those jobs you kind of don't want to advertise because <laughs> people are always going to come looking for you. And, and um, you do sign language? Is that what I heard too? Your ASL? Congrats. That, that's just amazing. Um, and again, you, you are you're intertwined with the community. And uh, you got a prize box. Yeah, I have uh, a treasure box for the kids. Nice, nice. So do they have to earn something? They have to do something? or they, they bring the, When they bring the attendance up, they get to get a prize out of the box. That's awesome. Well, uh, again, the, the way people speak about you is just um, 
it's just amazing what you do for that school. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. How are you? 27 years? Is that what I heard? Tw congratulations. And, um, you know, especially today, being able to, to take technology and, and intertwine it with, with lesson planning and, and, you know, that's what kids live on their devices. And the more that you can help deliver that to them um, to get instruction to them, it, it's going to pay off. You, too, were described as a highly effective teacher and, and mentor not just in your school but all over the county. So thank you for that. And I can only imagine when you ran into that student and he said that you're the one that inspired him to teach. So it doesn't get any better than that. So thank you so much for everything that you've done for school system. <laughs> so we'll start down here with Mr. Gibson and you can say a few words and thank you again. Please. Lovely. Uh, well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to thank Ms. Perello and the Board of Education for this recognition and the opportunity to speak publicly. Teachers do not exist in a bubble. Although I'm the one being recognized here today, my work does not stand on its own. Many of the su successes I have as an educator are a testament to the hard work, dedication, and excellence of other staff members. The students who succeed in my classes are building on the good habits, knowledge, and work ethic instilled in them by others. The members of the Social Studies Department, Bob Bowser, John Webster, James Wojnowski, Aaron Kraft, John Jaracco, and our department chair, John Hughes, contribute significantly to the daily work of my classroom. I am one person in an ecosystem of educators, all of whom are playing their own important part in the education of our students. Many of the people who make a daily and important contribution to our students go unrecognized or underappreciated. I'm happy to acknowledge a few of them now. Our instructional assistants, who play a critical role in staffing our classrooms, working with our teachers, and assisting our students. The front office and counseling department secretaries, who are often the first staff members to encounter our students and shape their perspectives on the day. Our special education department, who are critical as case managers as well as educators. The building service team, the efforts of whom frequently are on scene, even when they happen right in front of other people's eyes. Our coaches, sponsors, and volunteers who through their long hours make our extracurricular activities and sports possible and serve as valuable mentors in our students' lives and academics. The building resource officer in our building who provides an outlet and daily guidance to many of our students while also contributing to a safe learning environment. Our bus drivers, frequently the first and last representatives of the school district to see our students and who often set the tone and measure the pulse of student behavior. The administrative team, our assistant principals, our administrative intern, and our principal, Kathy Perello, whose efforts before, during, and after the school day support the work of all the other members of our building. And finally, our parents and guardians, who partner with us and trust their students to us in our joint effort to better prepare them for the future. In this endeavor, I'm being recognized today but I recognize that I am one small part of the larger effort contributing to the success of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Everything he said, but um, I'm gonna talk to my folks. I don't wanna talk be Talk to rude. whomever you'd like. Why not? I am um, humbled. They know I'm a crier. Someone do me. We got plenty of tissues. <laughs> I can't tell you guys. I'm an absolute firm believer in the village. I swear by the village. I preach the village to staff, to the, the resource officer standing out there, right over there. I was preaching the village to him. <laughs> we are a village. St. Charles High School, Charles County Public School, we are a village. And everyone plays a role in the village. My village allows me to be me and to make it easy to be great. They make it easy to love our students. I, people always ask me, why do you work with high school kids? I love them. I absolutely love my job. I love working with high school students. Most important, they're our future, so I gotta worry about my future. That's number one. That you, you can shape them, mold them. 
my village let me do any craziness that I come up with. <laughs> They're just like, it's Clark. I'm like, yeah, but we have two days to put together a wedding for 10,000 people. <laughs> and they let me be me. I was very shocked and surprised when people were saying congratulations. I'm like, what are you congratulating me for? I'm going to be good. So what, what? And I had to think, did I yell at anybody today? <laughs> did I tell how many parents are concession stand? Let me re -roll, rewind real fast yesterday. But then when they said this, I was shocked and again humbled. I do things because I love it, just out of love, not for recognition, none whatsoever. As I was explaining to the officer, things like these make me uncomfortable because I just feel it's just, you do what you love and it just makes you happy and therefore it trickles down to everyone else. And that's God, honestly, truly how I feel. Um, he's not here, Mr. Mackey, Harvard Lamb, even Mr. Condley, they just let me be me and I can't thank them enough for letting the craziness, oh no, I'll take that back. <laughs> They fall in line sometimes with my craziness, you know, so, but again, I cannot, cannot thank you guys so much, so much. I, I just can't. My, my Spartan village, I'm sorry other people, but the Spartan nation is the best of St. Charles High School. And I'm, I'm just going to say this, a lot of times in the community, our particular school in general, sometimes get a negative rep. And what I love, I'm a firm believer in action speaks for itself. So when they talk about our students in a negative light, I love the fact that they show up without having to say nothing whatsoever and let their actions speak for themselves. And by them being them, it allows me and us to do what we love and just have a good time. And I always tell the kids at school, listen, my day is fun. Don't <laughs> piss me off today by making me work. Work for me is having to write you up or discipline you. Do not ruin my Friday. Let's keep on rolling and having a good time because I honestly generally enjoy my job no matter what. Even the Relay for Life, I know I'll probably harass you into buying that basket, but get ready. <laughs> so, you know, we got to make sure we look good when we put on our event. I also have to make sure that we stand out and we set the example for others, and that's how I feel they do. And so I have to follow their example and just be great. But thank you, guys. I love you guys. Love, love you guys. Dr. Navarro and the school board and Principal Corhorse, thank you so much for this honor. Congratulations to all of you up here. Um, Principal Corhorse, they often say that a crew is only as good as their captain. And you are a great captain of the ship at John Hansen. And I thank you for that because you give us space to be the teachers that we are. Um, and I want to thank you for supporting me always since my first day, since the first time I met you. And I appreciate all you've done for, our, for me and also for our other teachers and our students and our staff. Um, I've worked in many schools, and I must say that John Hanson is a place where you feel safe and welcome. And we love each other. And you can feel it when you enter our school. So thank you for being that great captain. Um, a, <laughs> a special thank you to my students for making teaching challenging and worth it. It's always worth it to teach kids and see them grow and change into uh, great citizens. Uh, thank you to my family. That's my supportive husband back there, Henry. <laughs> and especially to my mother, Gladys Cooper. She's sitting right back there. Wave your hand, Mom. Um, I was born into her classroom. My first memories of school are not of kindergarten. It's of visiting my mother's second grade classroom and helping her decorate it. It's of being in my brother's first grade classroom and watching them when I was only four years old, uh, just to make sure they were quiet. And I took a yardstick and kind of hit them if they weren't. <laughs> but <laughs> I also cherish the lessons my grandmother shared of her 47 years in education as an educator and school principal. And she passed those on to my mother and I. She said, treat everyone with respect, but especially the staff that supports your teachers and administrators. <coughs> she taught us to have a giving spirit with children and that teaching is about educating the whole child. Thank you, mom, my first teacher. 
25 years after your retirement, you are still excited to hear my stories every day about my kids. <laughs> I appreciate you helping me decorate my classroom this year. It is true that life comes full circle, and I would not be the teacher that I am today without your support. So thank you all for this honor, and thank you, Mom. <laughs> She said real quick. Sorry? Can I piggyback off of something she said real quick? Sure. So, Ms. Nicole Hurst was my son's middle school vice principal, and I will concur with you. He is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Farrar. Well, I wasn't prepared for this one, <laughs> but I just want to first thank you all for actually recognize, uh, recognizing us because sometimes we go and we may not feel appreciated. And I want to thank my family, friends, and coworkers who came out to support me. As we all know, being an educator can be demanding. So I thank you for always motivating me and encouraging me to continue. And I want to give a special thanks to Dr. King for nominating me. It was a big, big surprise. Um, and I'm just happy that you value me and recognize my hard work and dedication. Um, it's been a long journey <laughs> trying to get my master's, so I'm almost done. And without them, I probably would have just crumbled and like, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to just continue my journey as an educator. Um, I know I teach the students, but I also learn a lot from them as well. And I just hope I can, con can continue to um, instill in them values that they could take way beyond second grade. And I'm just excited to continue to impact them. And I hope I just have an everlasting positive impact on their lives. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> Thomas. I want to thank Ms. Lewis and Ms. Chris for nominating me and my Dr. Brown family, of course. <coughs> my kids couldn't be here. They have to work, so, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Liber. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. One, or Mr. Wonderling for um, nominating me for this award. It's, it's humbling, um, and um, I really appreciate it. It's a great honor. And um, I'd like to reiterate what some other of my colleagues have said, that someone who is considered an exemplary employee doesn't become one um, in a vacuum, especially in a school setting, especially in an elementary school setting. Um, I am fortunate and blessed to go to school every day and to work with a staff of exemplary professionals. And I don't take that for granted. We have an amazing staff, an amazing community at T.C. Martin, and it's true what I told Mr. Uh, Mr. Wonderling, I wouldn't want to work anyplace else. Um, my husband every once in a while tries to tempt me to come and, and work for him. <laughs> And um, I tell him no, first of all, because I don't want him to be my, mo my boss. But secondly, because I told him there are no kids there. And I can't imagine having a career um, that doesn't involve working with children. And that's truly the best part of my job is, is working with the kids. So, thank you again. Thank you. have uh, a couple things for you and we're going to take some pictures.
Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hi, Mr. Schwartz. I will read the rules for public forum. Speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. Prior to the start of our public forum this evening, I would like to reiterate a provision of the rules for public forum that you just heard. Our rules for public forum do not allow for speakers to make statements related to personnel matters or the actions of individual staff or the private lives of any individual. We do not allow for comments to reference or include the names of staff members in a negative manner or make accusations against them in a setting which does not allow for any response by the individual named. This is not the time or place for such statements and is not the purpose of our public forum. As chairperson, I will direct speakers who violate this provision to immediately end their comments. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Schwartz. We have 11 speakers signed up this evening. The first speaker is Herman Barber. Good evening, board. Um, how are you? My name is Herman Barber. I spoke before you last year about this matter, and um, unfortunately, I still think I need to bring this matter before you again. Um, last year, I was a parent of two students in Charles County. This year, I'm probably a parent of five students. So I have seven students total, um, ages ranging from 14 to four. Um, again, my concern, again today, and I bring it to you again, is why in this state where we just elected our first black governor, that we still have 11 schools named after slave owners. I will read the names of the schools to you. So. Morris McDonough, Thomas Stone, General Smallwood, John Hansen, Benjamin Stoddard, Barry Elementary, Dr. Gustavus Brown, Dr. James Craig, Daniel St. Thomas Jennifer, Arthur Middleton, and Dr. Samuel Mudd. I said it last year and before, you wouldn't expect any Jewish students to go to a school named after Adolf Hitler. So while we continue to have are African-American students subjected to going to schools named after oppressors? And I'll just read some briefly, just, um, just name some of the schools. Harford County has changed names of their schools, and Arundel County has changed names of their schools. 
Loyola of Maryland has changed the names. Towson University, Woodrow Wilson in DC was changed to uh, Jackson Reed. So this is not something that should be out of the realm of your purview and your responsibility as a school board. Um, I will say this and I'll just briefly, this is from an expert at Harf Harford County and what they said basically, um, I will quote, the superintendent and administration believe that maintaining the name of an owner of enslaved persons as part of the name of a school is inconsistent with the educational mission of Harford County Public Schools. Um, this was in response where they changed the name of William Packer um, Elementary School and also John Archer. So I say to you again, and some of you are new members, and some of you, I, I know a couple of your board members, one of them is a member of NLCP. I think last year the student members said that you were gonna have a working committee. I don't know what happened, but I think it should be a change. And I always talk to my children about positive energy and setting a culture. I think from this neg these 11 schools where it's negative energy, we can, as a community, come together in finding the correct names and create positive energy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening there. Um, Mike, that was a good leader and that has never been done before. And anyway, here it is 2022. Uh, we in a predominantly district of color kids and what, what went on over at uh, General Smallwood Middle School is ridiculous. Um, if you look at the contracts, morality contracts in Howard County, Calvert, St. Mary's, Alexandra City, Fairfax, there's a morality clause in it, social media clause in it. You know, our 2023 contract or agreement with the uh, Teachers uh, Association, I don't know who wrote it, but the agreement was horrible. But I'll say this here, Dr. Vero, as a woman of color, I, I, I would think, I know the board's responsibility. However, what's going on in that school is ridiculous. For the statement that that teacher or whatever made is ridiculous, the posting. And then there was a second email come out to tell teachers to clean up their social media page and make them private. That's, it's insane, but I'll say this here, and I'm, this may sound crazy, but I do know, as much as I disagree with Dr. Hill, whenever anything that happened in this school district, she sent out a general email. You've been solid. You're on Twitter all day, every day. You've been solid. solid Mr. Choss, uh, please, uh, please observe the rules that were read. But I'll say this here. I encourage my daughter and four other teachers to come to Charles County because I believe in it. But this is a sad day. One of them is in that building at General Smallwood. If it was up to me, I'm not a quitter, and my kid is not a quitter. But if it was up to me, I would tell her, get the hell out of here. Good evening. My name is Shauna Maya Marks, and I'm the mom of three. One, a graduate of CCPS, and two, currently that attend. I'm also the founder of Charles County Moms of Color, the co-founder of Maryland Moms of Color, and the admin and founding member of Charles County Rise. A few weeks ago, a st students came to their parents with pictures of their former teacher. They Googled their teacher because they did not understand why she hated them so much. Once they found the racist images on her social media, they understood it loud and clear. I know, I know, we have freedom of speech, but there's also consequences that come with that freedom. I cannot scream in a crowded building, fire, and there's no fire. Today I stand with that young man that per I personally know and that was brave enough to show his mom and me those racist images. And I do not throw that word around loosely because it will lose value. Racism is the process by which systems and policies Actions and attitudes create unfair opportunities and outcomes for people based on race. And even though the Confederate flag was denounced as a hate symbol, the Confederate flag continued to remain popular among white supremacists and Southerners who claim it is their heritage. Not sure what heritage that is when they lost the war. I'm asking for the school board to take a close look at their policies and listen to their students. We are not discussing this one incident, but there are many more. For example, 
a lifelong educator, asked a student who is Puerto Rican, how, is, how was your experience with the school system when you came to our country? Like Puerto Rico is not a part of the United States of America. Another teacher teaching students about indigenous people, calling them savages. When that student said, hey, that is my people, he said, she said, well, I'm just teaching what's in the curriculum. When another history teacher was talking about immigration, she looked at the Latino student and stated, you know all about that, don't you? Or the other history teacher that made inappropriate comments to a same-sex couple. Students should be able to attend schools that are free from racial bias, inclusive, and have teachers that promote a positive environment for learning and student well-being. Thank you for my time. Have a great evening. Good evening. My name is Erica Thomas. This evening I come to express my concern, disappointment, and demand for action concerning the ongoing employment of a CCPS employee who has demonstrated incompetence, bias, and harmful behaviors towards Charles County students. Ma'am, again, I need to remind okay, you, please, of, of the rules. I'm, are we going to stop my time? Do I get my 15 seconds back? We, we'll allow. But Okay, as the mother of the child who displayed those pictures after his grades were changed by a, a teacher, this teacher said the grand, I'm sorry, she called it the grade wizard. The grade wizard changed these grades. I've been a substitute teacher in that school and watched her leave classes unattended and sat there with those children at Milton Summers Middle Ma School. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to. a STEM student at Milton Ma Summers. Ma'am, I have to please Kathleen remind you. Ma'am, I have to remind you of the rules of public forum, please. Ma'am. Ma'am, they have to stop, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicole Barker. I'm presenting for both teachers and parents. I'm an employee of Charles County, as well as a mother of a young man in kindergarten. And I want to express my grave concerns with the school system. As we attend to the 26 other students in the class, we do not escort the students out that are flipping chairs and cursing teachers out and cursing other students out. It is alarming to me that and I do understand that it's not yours. I understand that it's the Maryland board who has made this requirement, just made it possible. I need for the board, Charles County, other parents to get on board and support because my child is not exposed to that type of chaos in the house. I don't curse at home. I don't curse adults out. If there is a show that has a curse word, I don't play it in the background for my five-year-old to hear. My child should not be exposed to children flipping chairs and having the 26 students escorted out of the classroom while that one is causing chaos. We want to talk about equality and equity, and we got to be able to t take care of the 26. When do they matter? When do teachers matter? This is a problem. You think this year is a problem finding substitute in teachers or qualified individuals? Next year is going to be terrible. You, that's the teacher you're going to have. Because the teachers that are qualified and that love children and love teaching and love passion for teaching, have that passion, are being pushed out. I'm being pushed out because I don't feel safe to go to school. There is a number of teachers that I have spoken to that are ready to leave now. And these are teachers who have 15 years of experience. Not 15 years just passing by. 15 years that I would put my child, my child in their classroom because they're amazing and they love what they do. We would still take our penny pay if we had support from the Maryland board. It goes beyond Charles County and I'm well aware of that. And I appreciate it as much as you all have given to us to support us, but something has to be done to support the teachers and to protect the 26 students in the classroom that go to school and feel unsafe. Education is a purpose. We need to be behind our students. We need to be behind our teachers. If I went into Target and flipped shelves and cursed the teller out, what would they do to me? 
Oh, okay, they will announce it on Target. Okay, Target employees, please go ahead and escort yourself out. We have somebody in aisle five that's flipping shelves. No, ma'am, no, sir. They would escort me out. This is a huge passion of mine because my friends and loved ones in my school alone are ready. There is a mass exorcism coming of teachers. Our school system is going to hurt. Our children is going to hurt. Our future is in danger. And we need your support. And we need parents' support. Thank you. Samson with the Charles County NAACP. And, uh, on Tuesday, November 1st, the Charles County NAACP became aware of a Charles County teacher's personal social media account that contained racial insensitive materials. Several of the most concerning posts contain images of the teacher posing with Confederate flag memorabilia and giving the three-fingered salute in front of what appears to be a portion of the Confederate flag. The Charles County NAACP strongly supports First Amendment rights and the freedom of speech and expression. However, it is equally vital that students are protected from hateful ideologies and from any discriminatory treatment that may be meted out from school staff that espouse racially insensitive, insensitive views. It is possible that a teacher could hold these views and treat all students fairly. However, it is equally possible that those same uh, odious beliefs could unconsciously or not seep into the grading, discipline, and, and overall treatment of students. Parents should be able to send their children to school without worrying that they will be treated differently based on their skin, skin color, race, religion, or national origin. It is hoped, as part of its investigation, the Charles County School Board will thoroughly review the discipline and grading of this teacher to ensure that students have not been treated in a discriminatory manner. Enhanced diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility training for Charles County staff could also be helpful in ensuring that school teachers are aware of policies they must follow as part of their chosen profession. The social media account in question has since been cleaned of the disturbing images, but the teacher has a long road ahead in restoring trust within the community. This incident begs the question of why the current CCPS policies do not address this type of behavior. It is a concern for the Charles County NAACP that this behavior will be, will be able to continue without sufficient safeguards embedded in the school's policies to prevent future reoccurrences. For the Charles County NAACP President Diotha Sweat, it is unfortunate that in, 20, in 2022 we are still dealing with racial hatred, particularly from a school teacher. I can only hope that the newly elected Charles County School Board will work to change policy to address this type of incident with its staff and work with the teachers to make sure certain that their personal beliefs are not allowed to negatively impact the education and well-being of our students of color. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Evening. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. My name is Pascal Small, and I have three kids in CCPS. So we know the um, we know the issue that we're talking about. First, I want to say that the way that we just addressed one of your parents was completely disrespectful. You ask us to show up in all so many ways. You ask us to show up to meetings and workshops, and it's all very great. But it's very performative if on the day that we show up with a concern, with a real issue for the safety of children, you all shut us down and you all send us back, and you all tell us to sit in our place. So I thought that was extremely rude. Students should be able to attend schools that are free from racial biases, that are inclusive and have teachers that promote a positive environment for learning and student well-being, and clearly that's an issue here. I really don't believe that that's core to our beliefs as a district, but if we're not doing anything about it, and we're just crossing our fingers and saying we hope it doesn't happen again, and we can't do anything because there's nothing in policy, then it is core to our beliefs as a district. And until we start changing policy, and until we stop saying that this is not okay behavior from our educators or students or staff or anybody that's in a school building, then it is core to who we are as a district. And we need to take a really deep look at ourselves. I know you all are exiting as a board, 
and I know new board members are here, and so we are talking about change of policy, because the next time this happens, which it will continue to happen unless we start acting on these things and these incidents, then nothing is gonna change. You're gonna continue to send our, to our students into unsafe school environments. We just had a school safety meeting like less than a month ago, talking about and assuring parents that where we're sending our children to is safe, is affirming, is joyous, is inclusive, and yet you have educators that are openly racist, that are openly displaying that racial biases in their grading, their interactions with students and parents. So unless we start standing up and actually doing something about it, this is performative, this is talk. I don't wanna be a part of it. And that teacher's right, but also she's wrong because my, my, my students are not gonna be having that teacher because I'll take them out of the system. Because without my students, without my babies, without these parents' babies, you don't have a system to serve. We don't have jobs, right? So unless you start protecting our babies in everyday interactions, and again, our district is predominantly black and brown and you are standing by this teacher and that's not just a one-time problem. This is a community issue. We've seen it in all of our classrooms. We've seen it across our schools. We've seen it from support staff, from educators, from principals, and from substitute teachers. So we do ask for this teacher to be terminated. We ask for a thorough study into the racial climate and environment within CCPS schools. We are also asking for a formal apology regarding the lack of response and failure to acknowledge the incident appropriately needs to be issued to CCBS students, both the students that are in that teacher's classroom today and the students and parents that were in her care before. Also, we need transparency Your time in our is reporting. Up, Thank you. Good evening, how are you? I live in White Plains. Um, my mother is a recent new hire for the, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. She's saying she I can hear you, but I don't think it's coming through the mic. It doesn't sound like can Hello? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, my mother is Dolores Oniawa. She is a recent new hire with the Charles County Parks and Recs. She actually works at the Madam Woman Elementary School. She started on October 3rd, and about two weeks after she started, by chance during the weekend, she heard on WTOP that there was an incident where a student bought a stun gun to the school. Um, we did a little bit of research and we found that at the school there was another student in April who actually bought another stun gun. And before then, there was another student in February who bought another stun gun. And if you want, I have the Charles County Sheriff's Report here, as well as the article from WTOP. My question is, why is this being allowed to happen? And also, why aren't the staff members notified of when an incident like this happens? My mother told me that when she told her boss, her boss told her that there was nothing that they could do. My mother's response is, well, if there's nothing that they could do, I don't want to end up like another Uvalde. And we also see what happened at the University of Virginia. Um, I'm just concerned for the safety of the students, the safety of the staff members, and the safety of the teachers, because I feel like that's paramount. There's also no sort of orientation for anybody who is a new staff member. When my mother asked about any kind of um, workplace environment hostility or any kind of orientation when it came to safety in the teachers or school environment, she was told that she could go on YouTube and look at a video from the Department of Homeland Security. But there was no specific protocol. I wanna know why this is happening and what you can do to change it. Because my mother's sitting right there in the green jacket. She feels very, very fearful when she goes to school or when she goes to the aftercare program. She actually told me that a couple of weeks ago there was a boy there who was being bullied and he no longer comes back to the school now. I just don't want this to escalate to the point where we do have another Uvalde. So I'm asking you all to please look into safety protocol 
if you could actually have this as an orientation for your new employees, for your new teachers, for your new aftercare workers, so that we can prevent any kind of workplace or school-based violence. Thank you very much. Mr. Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Is there an open floor session that we can speak to? No, sir. I'm sorry. You, 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 you no, needed to sign. We have the time. You needed to sign up on, on uh, yeah, so my public yeah, forum. But I'm just saying if we yeah. have the time to speak. No, sir. I'm sorry. Not, not in this venue. Not at this venue. All right, we're going to continue with our agenda. <laughs> this time we need a motion to approve the minutes. Which one? Sorry. I motion to approve the executive session minutes of October 11th. Second. So it's made by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Wilson. All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Need a motion for the regular meeting minutes? It's not unanimous. I'm sorry, unanimous of those <laughs> present. Ms. Uh, Ms. Battelockhart wasn't there. So, me, I'm sorry, sir. Please, can you just wait? No. I'm so sir, I'm what sorry. We were just discussing, that's it. That's it. No, no. Trying to figure out what's going on. It, so you haven't addressed us about sir. the concerns that we have. So we need to sir, I'm sorry, but this is this is not the forum to do that. We no, no. And we're to hear from us. Meeting, we'll, we'll no, no one's yelling. No one's yelling. No one's yelling. Okay, are we? We're going to go on now with our uh, the rest of the items on our agenda. Yeah. Yes. Sure. So, need a motion to move uh, for to approve the meetings of the regular session. So moved it's for moved. October eleventh, second. Yes. It's moved by Miss McGraw, seconded by Miss Abel. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. It's everyone except Ms. Battle Lockhart. Uh, personnel? Motion to approve. Second. Made by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Wilson. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, next is the intercategory budget change, which we heard earlier in the meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. McGraw, seconded by Ms. Abel. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. And finally, uh, the 2023 legislative positions. Motion to approve. Second. Made by Ms. Abel and seconded by Ms. Wilson. Any discussion on those? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that's uh, Ms. McGraw. Ms. Abel, Ms. Wilson, myself, um, Ms. Brown, and Mr. Hancock, all those opposed? Okay, any abstention? No. Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. 
Second. 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 <laughs> it's made. Motion to, to adjourn by Ms. Sable and seconded by Mr. Hancock. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you.